Isaac of the Hand. GH. A flag bearer, a great man, a fantastic man, an affable man, a man who himself is a media practitioner. He is accompanied by Professor Nana Jane Opopuajima, first female vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast, distinguished female academic. And you all know John Mahama, you've all worked with him one way or the other. You've engaged him on many levels and on many platforms. Tonight, you'll be spending two hours with you and hopefully you will interact and engage as we all expect. Professor Jay Nana Okokwajima, kindly please welcome her very warmly. Thank you, Madam. And of course, the man of the moment, His Excellency John Dramani Mahama. May I please ask you to have your seat as we begin this program tonight. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for gatherings such as this. We thank you for making it possible for us to come here this evening. We ask you, Almighty Father, to guide us, see us through these proceedings, and be sure that when we are done, we'll give you all the grace and the glory. All we ask is that you help us to build the Ghana that all of us will be proud of and the Ghana that all of us want. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, this and many, many more we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kempinski. Tonight we present to you John Dramani Mahama, trustworthy, honest, credible, a nation builder, friend of the media, and yes, a man we all hope will soon be sworn in as president of this beautiful country of ours. We are hoping that all of you gathered here will help us as we firm up on our message as we firm up on our manifesto, as we try as much as possible to prosecute the agenda for Mahama 2024. I invite all who want the agenda change to join us this evening on all the various media portals. And of course, for those who are blogging, please join me and help us so that we can build the Ghana that all of us are proud of. I'm very hopeful that this evening will be a fantastic exchange of ideas a cross-fertilization of ideas. And for all of you in the media, you know that we need you to take out our message. We need a platform. We need to hear our voices. We need to ask each other questions. We also need to vet some of the things that we've put out. Mr. Mahama is a man that all of you know. You've dealt with at one time or the other. Everybody calls him the nation builder. In phase one of John Mahama, what he wanted to do was to build what? Infrastructure. To build a foundation that all of us can stand on. Tonight we are here to hear his message on the campaign for 2024. And I ask all of you to join me to welcome John Dramani Mahama to this evening's presence with you, ladies and gentlemen from the media. Good evening. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished colleagues. Um, I'm happy to be with you. And I know what the importance of encounters like this are. You are the vehicle that we have to use to send our message out to the people. So I'm very happy that you responded to our call at relatively short notice. But let me thank you, uh, Joyce uh, Bawa Mukhtari, uh, my spokesperson, uh, who also happens to uh, be a relative for your kind introduction. Um, and I say good evening to you, all my colleagues in the field of media and communications, and to you, the millions watching and listening from across our country and the world at large. We are at a crucial moment in our nation's history with 153 days to the next presidential and parliamentary elections. Two years ago, in 2022, right here in this same auditorium, in my prophetic address to the nation, I submitted to the government and to all Ghanaians that Ghana was at a crossroads. That speech has been called a crossroads uh, speech. Unfortunately, the government refused to listen to that altruistic conversation and the raft of viable and innovative policy proposals that I offered to them that evening. Two years on, our country is in the worst state. In between the period, I have been having a series of innovative conversations with you, conversations that do not talk down or talk 
at Ghanaians, truthful and honest, continuous conversation that admit that our nation is in peril. Because Ghanaians have victory in our DNA, I know that despite these perils, we can overcome our difficulties. Let me thank you for your presence this evening for my first major media encounter ahead of the December 2024 elections. In addition to my digital conversations, I intend to have a number of such media engagements, not only in Accra, but in other parts of the country. As I have done when I was president, I passionately believe in transparency and accountability and engagements with the fourth estate of the rim. These have always been an effective way to reach our citizenry. And this is why I'm happy today to be with you again to sustain the conversations about our dear nation, Ghana. And do not worry, the media encounters and my virtual engagements will not deny you the opportunity to catch me for one-on-one -on -one interviews either in your studios or whenever we meet at events. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the time for change. The time for change has come. And it is not just a slogan, but a clarion call to the heart and soul of our nation. This is a time for change because of the urgent need for a transformative shift in the way we govern, the way we create jobs, the way we live, the way we provide social services, including health and education, and the way we envision the future of our dear country, Ghana. After almost eight years under the deplorable leadership of the Akufuado and Baumea administration, we have seen our country sink into a serious economic abyss. The current economic mess sums up the verdict on this MPP administration. The harsh reality is that for most citizens, the piteous journey over the period has been a very bitter experience of economic and social deprivation. The unprecedented levels of poverty, unemployment, deterioration in our people's livelihoods, and social inequity have exposed the dubious strategy of hiding incompetence under sloganeering. It confirms without hesitation that the disruptive and hasty experimentation with the lives of the Ghanaian people was underpinned by a naive exuberance, arrogance, and indeed selfishness. And I'm referring to the economic challenges that have shattered the dreams of our youth and the aspirations of the vulnerable in our society. No one has been spared, not children, not adults, including the middle class and the elderly have all been hit very hard. And I dare say, even you, the media, have not been spared. Fellow Ghanaians, and that's a very famous refrain, fellow Ghanaians, notwithstanding these challenges, I am imbued with the optimism and a steadfast belief in my God Almighty and the amazing creativity of the Ghanaian people to assure you tonight that together we shall turn around this tide. We shall turn this government's destructive tide into positive and progressive waves, waves that will reverberate in every home and corner of our country and across the globe, demonstrating that Ghana has once again gotten back on track. Let me give you five good and solid reasons why we shall reset Ghana and turn the tide. One is experience. Unlike any other candidate, I have navigated, Ghana's, I've navigated Ghana through tough economic waters before. My presidency was marked by significant infrastructure development, building economic buffers for inclusive growth while ensuring macroeconomic stability. I understand the intricacies of national crisis management and possess the proven experience to reset Ghana from the economic challenges that we face today. The second point is visionary leadership for economic revival. My vision for Ghana is rooted in sustainable development. I'll focus on revitalizing our economy for job creation through industrialization, enhancing agriculture, and ensuring the efficient use of our natural resources. My administration will introduce cross-cutting innovative policies that are inclusive, growth-oriented, and capable of restoring hope back to our youth. And the third point is commitment to job creation. Recognizing that our youth are the backbone of this nation, my government will prioritize and create decent, well-paying, and sustainable jobs 
by fostering a conducive environment for entrepreneurship and innovation. The government and the private sector will not only tackle unemployment but also inspire a generation of change makers and problem solvers. And the fourth point is championing social justice and equality. I wholeheartedly believe in a Ghana where every citizen, regardless of their background or gender, has equal opportunities to thrive. Under my leadership, social interventions and educational reforms will be strengthened. The vulnerable in our society will be protected and given the opportunity to change their circumstances. And let me add that gender equality will be a cardinal feature of the Mahama Jinnano Pokwajima Flagstaff House. We we'll lead an administration that promotes gender inclusivity in every government policy. And that is why we propose to establish a National Women's Bank to empower women to close the gender gap financially. One million women will benefit from the Women's Bank to finance their small and medium scale businesses. And the fifth point is a call to national unity. Ghana's strength lies in its diversity. The polarization and partisan politics that have characterized the current administration's tenure should have no place in Ghana. As President, I will foster a spirit of national cohesion, encouraging all Ghanaians to contribute towards nation building regardless of their political, religious or ethnic affiliation. To the youth of Ghana, I say, I understand your frustration and your disillusionment. Many of you are feeling very frustrated. I can relate to the recent cynicism and massive mistrust you have in our body politics because the current government has been undeserving of your trust. The challenges of today might seem insurmountable, but I urge you to look beyond the present and dream with me of a reset Ghana. The Ghana we all want, where your talents and hard work will determine your success. I promise a Ghana where you are not sidelined, but at the forefront of change, where you can live happy lives and still achieve your optimum potential. This is not just a promise, it's a commitment. I will reset the economy and Ghana will be open for business for 24 hours a day. <laughs> Leadership is about vision. And the 24-hour economy is the vision to create decent and well-paying jobs. When I talk about the 24-hour economy, we need to understand the underlying vision behind that policy. The 24-hour economy is the means to an end. And the end is putting Ghana on a solid foundation for accelerated growth and development. We need to attain the growth rhythm that will turn our country into a developed economy and eliminate the abject levels of poverty we are witnessing today. An economy that will manufacture many of its needs, including food and beverages, drugs, clothing, and more, such that we can address the exchange rate volatilities due to needless imports. The world is moving very fast. We need to keep up with this new rhythm. So first think of the 24-hour economy as an accelerator the best accelerator or catalyst we could possibly have. A 24-hour economy will increase the production and distribution of goods and services and accelerate the economic exchanges between people and companies. And with that, we will start growing at an unprecedented pace while providing decent jobs for our young people. As I've said, leadership is about vision, and I stand by it. But leadership is also about caring. It's about giving people genuine, solid hope. And this is what the 24-hour economy is really about. And let me explain further. The 24-hour economy is a solid way to replace imports with homegrown production of goods, and thus create a solid base for a vibrant Ghanaian industry. In many instances, we don't import goods because they are better than what we produce, we import them because nobody produces them here in Ghana in the first place, or because our local production is insufficient. Therefore, the stimulus packages for companies wanting to participate in the 24-hour economy will convince businesses, and I'm sure of it, 
to start producing import substitutes. And do you know why? Because the market for such products already exists. If the market did not exist, we will not be importing to satisfy demand. And so through the 24-hour economy, businesses will be incentivized to start produ producing for this market. It is the simplest way to start growing sustainably. And when this begins to happen, imagine the number of new jobs that will be created. And here is another thing about the 24-hour economy. It will boost exports. Many Ghanaian companies still will start looking for foreign partners to develop their businesses to take advantage of the new opportunities available to them via this policy. Indeed, thanks to the African Continental Free Trade Area, these partnerships will open new foreign markets to Ghanaian companies. And goods produced in Ghana will then be exported to other parts of our continent, to Asia, to Europe, or North America, using the connections of these foreign partners that we have had. And as I've said before, I will personally chair an accelerated exports development program that will, de that will identify and promote exports in the manufacturing, agricultural products, textiles, food and beverages, pharmaceuticals, and the extractive sectors. It is important to understand that the 24-hour economy will generate a network of foreign markets for Ghanaian entrepreneurs and will transform Ghana into an export-led economy. So I say that the 24-hour economy is also about national pride. It is about creating jobs through enhanced productivity, connecting Ghana with the wider world, and making companies proud of what they can accomplish here. Once the policy is set in motion, the rhythm of growth will start to accelerate exponentially, and Ghana will be open for business again. This initiative will anchor my determination to change the structure of the Ghanaian economy through the active support of private sector-led growth. And so be assured that the 24-hour economic policy initiative is a well-thought-through, data-driven, evidence-based, and comprehensive policy to expand critical and strategic segments of our economy sustainably, and it will liberate Ghana from the shackles of unemployment and economic dependence. And so, governance and fighting corruption for development. I am committed to drastically reducing the size of government, and rightly so. This government has sufficiently proven to Ghanaians that with over 120 ministers and deputy ministers, all they could offer was to run our economy aground. I will run a lean, highly effective and efficient government of no more than 60 ministers and deputy ministers. And this is solid proof of my genuine commitment to curbing government expenditure. This leaner government will be the cleanest government Ghana has ever experienced. It will serve Ghanaians far better and set higher standards for future governments. What we have now can obviously never and should never be a yardstick for governance. My goal is to launch a renewed fight against corruption. I'll keep my appointees in check, and Ghanaians can be assured that drastic steps will be taken to punish the corrupt officials and their accomplices in this present administration. No actor in this NPP corruption enterprise will be spared. We'll also take action to repossess what has been unlawfully stolen from the Ghanaian people. As we all know, government procurement As we all know, government procurement is a significant source of corruption, and no economy can sustain inclusive and equitable social and economic well-being with a penchant for public service holders to be self-serving and corrupt, as is currently the case. The use of public finances will always be compliant with our national laws, transparent, justified by contemporary value for money tests, and solely in the interest of the broader citizens. If we want to eliminate corruption, we must increase accountability in government procurement processes. And accountability gives power back to the people. God willing, as the incoming president and leader, I assure the people of Ghana 
that the NDC is fully committed to accountability. And this is why one of our key policies will be to set up an independent value for money office to scrutinize all government procurements above $5 million threshold or as shall be recommended by Parliament. Transparency and accountability are the keys to fighting corruption and will fight corruption by creating an office that will dynamically scrutinize all government procurements coupled with a lean government of no more than 60 ministers and deputies. And I guarantee you that we will come out victorious in this fight against corruption. Developing the agriculture and agribusiness sector with specialized zones in all regions with support from the Farmer Service Centers and Exim Bank. Ladies and gentlemen, some people say agriculture belongs to poor people. But I say agriculture can generate significant wealth and employment. We live in a world crippled by the ever-increasing effects of climate change. And in this uncertain and sometimes volatile world, food security becomes a strategic issue. To put it simply, we cannot even begin to think about transforming Ghana if we don't put the right focus on agriculture. We cannot be successful in anything we do if we do not first put food on the table at an affordable cost for our people. Agriculture is the cornerstone of growth. Ignoring it is like trying to build a house without a foundation. The slightest storm will bring that house down. Without reliable access to affordable and nutritious food in sufficient quantity, growth and development are impossible. So I don't look at agriculture as an occupation for the poor. I look at it as the very basis of our future. The simplest way to achieve food security is to produce food locally. If you produce food locally, you are not dependent on imports. And so you can still feed the people even if international distribution chains are broken. We won't have to go to other countries begging for grain if we get things right. This is the food security strategy I'm fighting for, and this is why I'm looking at farmers, fishermen, and other protein producers as strategic partners in building the Ghana we want, a modern, vibrant, thriving Ghana. Others may look down on agriculture, but I don't because I'm a farmer myself. I see farmers as my close brothers and sisters because of their strategic importance in helping Ghana become a true black star, not only of Africa but of the world. Farmers and fishers inspire me and I hope that I will inspire them too. And let me just share three examples of the policies we will implement as soon as we form the next government. I've said already that we shall establish special agro-industrial zones in the 16 regions of our country to add value to local crops they have a comparative advantage to produce and thereby boost exports and reduce raw material imports. Secondly, we shall create opportunities for farmers to improve food security and bolster economic growth through the establishment of farmer service centers across the country. This will be enhanced by well-established farmers' cooperatives, advanced farming techniques, modern digital tools, and the promotion of agribusiness. And the third, we will launch a program similar to the Operation Feed Yourself and Industries program of the early 1970s to make Ghana self-sufficient in basic staples and curb unnecessary imports of things that we have a comparative advantage to produce. All three policies exemplify to the highest degree my vision of agriculture as the cornerstone of our future growth. True leadership, like I said, is about vision and about empowering the people to live that vision. Now I turn to digital youth. Let's face it, the digital revolution is here to stay. It has already transformed our lives in ways that were simply unpredictable only a few decades ago, and it will continue to do so. Around the world and here in Ghana, we now have digitized factories and even digital agriculture. This is the fourth industrial revolution. 
Indeed, the fifth industrial revolution, the cognitive age that brings human and machine intelligence into close proximity for sustainable growth, beckons us. And the sooner we embrace it, the more prosperous our nation will become. And this is why I'm a true and firm believer in the right to affordable and reliable internet for all our citizens. I believe that currently everybody should have access to internet connectivity. You may remember that four years ago, I promised Ghanaians that if elected president, I'll provide them with universal and affordable internet access. This promise still stands because my vision of a digital Ghana is as strong as ever. It is a vision that led me as president to deploy massive fixed and wireless broadband for reliable internet across our country, and it remains an undying vision. We need to be young in mind and in spirit. And this is a fabulous time in history, a time which we must be bold, create, and take advantage of the huge opportunities the digital world, particularly the digital economy, affords us. And so based on this vision of a new, vibrant digital Ghana, the next NDC government under my administration will partner with local tech startups and businesses to launch a digital jobs initiative to create at least 300,000 skilled employment opportunities for the youth in this sector. And so imagine this, 300,000 employment opportunities for our young people. And this is the field that they not only love, but they often excel at. I look at my children, my nieces and my nephews, and I'm amazed at their digital skills, as I'm sure many parents in Ghana are. So I'm telling you, like I tell everybody else, let these kids thrive. They are our future, so let them build this future. It will be glorious, I promise you. All they need from us is our support and understanding. And I promise all of them my full support and my wholehearted understanding. My dearest young Ghanaians, I stand by you 100% and I always will. When we talk about the digital revolution, we also need to talk about the digital divide about those who are being left behind. On my watch, I'll do whatever it takes to provide universal access and bridge the digital divide in this country. We must close that digital gap. The NDC promises this, and it was in our 2020 manifesto, that we shall train one million coding professionals in demand of digital skills for growth, business process outsourcing, and knowledge process outsourcing ecosystems, ensuring that no one is left behind in this digital revolution. One million coders, I mean, just think about it. And I believe we can do it. And this is our plan. It is our pledge to you. And no Ghanaian will be left behind in this digital revolution. Let me also assure the sports fraternity, that we shall develop our stadium infrastructure for track and field sports, will fix the deteriorating football pitches, and pay stipends to footballers in the Premier League, like we promised in 2020. What we call the lesser known sports shall also receive equitable attention, like we give soccer. And I have good news for the creative industry. Our overarching policy for the industry shall be the Black Star experience. And this will be geared towards boosting the tourism and creative arts sector. It will include the Pan-African Month, the Ghana Film Festival and Awards Month, the Ghanaian Heritage and History Month, the Fashion and Food Month, and the Diasporan Month. Additionally, we'll rehabilitate all our regional centers of national culture and make them available to the creative industry. We'll also support aging artists who currently, many of whom currently live in poverty. My colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, together we shall overcome. Together we shall reset the narrative and restore Ghana to its rightful place among the Committee of Nations. The time for change has come. The time to change this non-performing, corrupt government is now. Let us seize this moment to build the Ghana we want together for a brighter future for our children and for generations yet to come. May God bless our homeland Ghana. 
And I'd like to stop here and invite you to ask your questions so that we can continue the conversation about the many other issues I have left out for now. I thank you very much for your kind attention. And thank you, Your Excellency, for that insightful speech. And thank you for doing this at this time, at a time when duty bearers are refusing to engage the media like this and to open themselves up for questioning. You have not only decided to engage the media, the fourth estate of the realm, but to open yourself up for questions on various issues of national interest. We salute your commitment to transparency and accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for His Excellency. Now, friends from the media, it is time for questions and answers. And I'm going to be moderating this segment. I know you all came here prepared with your questions. But for the sake of the efficient management of time, we need to agree to some ground rules. Only media men are allowed to ask questions. Every media man in this room or woman in this room has the right to ask only one question. We will take questions in sets of five questions. Kindly keep your questions and the foundations for same, crisp and straight to the point. I know you shall cooperate with us. And so, if you have a question for His Excellency, can I see you by hand? Okay, I can see. Well, before I start calling you out, forgive me, um, let's give Anna to whom Anna is due. I know we have the GJ here, represented by the executives and led by their president. So, Mr. President, I'll give you the first bite. And then, so, so you can be at your position. A microphone will be brought to you there, and then you ask your question. From, but because he's the GJ president, we'll give him uh, the opportunity to ask two questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sami, and thank you, His Excellency. Um, I can't uh, ask questions without commenting on this wonderful event. His uh, Excellency, the former president, John Roman Mahama, on behalf of the National Executive of the Ghana Journalist Association, on behalf of the Inky Fraternity, we want to thank you for this wonderful opportunity to deliberate on matters of national interest. I also extend the same warm greetings to every one of us here. This media encounter with the flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress, His Excellency, former President John Brahman Mahama, is crucial because it further depends our democracy, and more importantly, it gives the media the opportunity to scrutinize the vision and programs of someone seeking to occupy the highest office in the land once again. At this juncture, the GJ would like to commend former President Mahama for availing himself once again for, of scrutiny as he outlines his visions and programs for the country. We hope that the former president continues on this path if he wins the election. So it will not be a nine-day wonder. I want to state that the former president is still a member of the GJ in good standing, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. We indeed appreciate that. Mm -hmm. yes. The GJ has the core mandate to ensure that journalists and media houses get the freedom to operate by holding government and society accountable. We are also duty bound to ensure the welfare of hardworking journalists. Therefore. I'll focus my brief questions on press freedom and the welfare of journalists. Press freedom, Your Excellency, the safety of journalists is one of the most critical issues that the GJ wants you to address if you win the upcoming election. In recent times, attacks on journalists and media houses have been on the rise, with some media personnel sustaining severe injuries. The situation was getting out of hand until we started blacklisting some high-profile personalities. 
One unfortunate aspect of this situation is the lack of political actors condemning attacks on journalists. The GDA believes that if influential individuals, including presidential candidates, like your humble self, condemn such attacks, the issue will diminish. These attacks contributed to our poor performance on the Web Press Freedom Index. This is something we need to work on. I must say that this year, our performance on the Press Freedom Index improved due to the blacklisting measures we instituted. Yeah, Mr. President, still waiting now for the your question. Now the question, yes. we want to ask, mm. Mr. President, to enhance press freedom in this country, we are demanding amendment of certain provisions of the Electoral Communication, Elect Electronic Communications Act and the Criminal Code, specifically Section 208 of the Criminal and Other Offenses Act of 1960. This arbitrary application of the laws only instills fear in the media and the public. We want to ask, should Mr. Mr. Mahama ascend to the presidency, what steps will he take to amend these objectionable laws? I want to state that even though these laws were not meant for journalists, we've ended up being the target, and many of our colleagues have suffered under them. This is certainly a step backward especially after the repeal of the Criminal Libel Act 20 years ago. Now, Mr. President, or former President, it is widely known, Mr. Former President, that the salaries of journalists, particularly those in the state-owned media, are significantly low. It is sad to know that this issue of poor salaries for journalists has contributed to a low ranking on the Press Freedom Index. If the NDC flag bearer becomes president, what will his government do about the low salaries of journalists working in especially the Thank you media? very Thank you. much, Mr. President, for these brilliant questions. Yes, I will take the next question from, I see Simon of Accra Times. Yes, um, can you bring the microphone here? Yes. Oh, thank you. Is it on? Hello. Thank you very much. My name is Simona Gena, the editor of the Accra Times and the dean of the Parliamentary Press Corps. Thank you for this opportunity. Your Excellency, as you are aware that uh, the depreciation of the city is affecting businesses in this country, please, I would like to know from you how are you going to stabilize the exchange rate? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Um, next question. I will go here. Kamala Kluche. Middle lane, Kamala Kluche. Please kindly speak into the mic. Kamala Kluche is my name. I work at Media General. Uh, there's excruciating hardship in the country. We have seen you lament on same. How do you intend solving this but whilst at this can you believe in ghana we are building a house to house the vice president and it's supposed to cost 13.9 million us dollars this is located at a switchback road your government at the time said it cost 5.9 million us dollars the VP currently dr baumia said they would have to do some renegotiation with the contractor. What do you intend to do about the weed infested house supposed to house your, uh, your VIP, okay. so to speak? Thank you very much, Kamala. Kafwide, I'll give you the. Okay. Thank you very Tomorrow much. Sand, I've seen you, yeah. so relax. Yeah, Kafwide, GTV. Mr. President, um, if you watch GTV tomorrow morning, you will see a bottle of orange water on my desk. It's not juice, 
it's from the river i personally fetched that water Kalamse is ravaging our environment, is polluting our waters, is destroying the farms. You were talking about agriculture and the fact that if we don't have food to eat, everything will be meaningless. I want to know what your plan is to deal with illegal mining, a.k.a. Kalamse. Thank you for your question. The masculinity has been too much, so let's go for a female voice. Nima from Ghana Web. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Your Excellency, please, I would like to find out from you what's your position on free SHS. Given that, and also, what is your thoughts on the proposal to pass the free SHS bill, given that the majority has entered, the bill will be coming to Parliament. Thank you very much, Nima. So this brings us to the end of the first set. The free SHS bill. Free SHS bill. So this brings us to the end of the first set of five. His Excellency will deal with these five and then we'll come back again. We're doing this till 10 p.m. So relax, you get the opportunity to ask your question. Your Excellency, we are ready for you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for your um, questions and also um, your commendation. Um, this will not be a 90 wonder. Everybody knows that when I was president, I held media encounters, you know, every year of my presidency. Uh, it's not been really the same under this government. Um, they've run away from the searing accountability to the media. We all know that Chapter 12 of our Constitution is on press freedom, and it has been one of the most progressive constitutions that any African country can have because it gives wide-ranging freedoms to the media to be able to do its work and principally to carry out their role as the watchdogs of the people not as the guard dogs of government some of us have abdicated that role and instead of being the watchdogs of the people we have been the guard dogs of government savaging people who question and try to hold government accountable. So we must take note of that. Uh, safety of journalists is important. And I must say that in this last administration, journalists have felt more afraid. They have felt more cowed. Many journalists have uh, been harassed. They have been forced to flee the country. I remember a journalist had to run to South Africa and stay there for some time to let things cool off before he returned. Another journalist in the Upper East region who questioned uh, 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 some issues to do with uh, illegal mining. Also had to run away from the region for fear that he was going to be uh, assaulted or harmed. Um, I remember uh, Ahmed Swali and his um, uh, uh, murder assassination, which up to today, government does not seem to have the political will to uh, 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 let the investigations go forward and bring the people who did this to justice. As long as these people are not brought to justice, it is, the possibility exists that they can do something similar in the future. And so these are things that we take seriously. And my track record when I was president um, is there for everybody to see that because I'm a colleague of yours, my, my training is in the media, and so I can empathize with the work you do and so definitely you can be sure that as president, I'm not going to condone or uh, uh, conspire to harass journalists uh, when they do the work that the Constitution has mandated them to do. We are willing to sit with you and look at any laws that are in contradiction with the Constitution. The Constitution is the, the overarching law of our country. And so if there are any laws that are punitive and constrain the media from doing its work, there are laws that we can look at and we can amend if necessary. The low salaries are not only the state-owned media, they are even worse in the private media. They are even worse in the private media. And so it's something that we need to attend to. The thing about media is that it is driven mostly by adverts. Unfortunately, Things have gotten worse because businesses are suffering currently. The budget for advertising has shrunk. And also because of the number of media that we have, dividing that little budget amongst the media makes it difficult 
to be able for the media owners to be able to guarantee uh, a, a bigger salaries. And so even in turning our economic fortunes around and bringing the private sector back onto the path of growth and growing our economy would create a bigger pot for us to be able to give more advertising to media houses so that they can improve the salaries of um, media people. But in the meantime, if you remember, we set up a media development fund. There were a few challenges at the time, and so we put it in abeyance for the meantime. But I think there is something that we can look at again. Set up a media development fund. Government puts uh, seed money into it. It was meant to improve training of journalists. It was meant to uh, attend to welfare of journalists and so on and so forth. And so it's something that we are willing to reactivate. And together with the GGA and all the other uh, media umbrella groups, we'll sit down and see how this media development fund can inure to the benefit of uh, 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 people in the media space. And so those are all things that uh, we are willing to look at. Um, the other question was... Um, so on the exchange rates? Yeah, on the exchange rates. Um, the immediate issue with the exchange rate in the economy is that the best signal Ghanaians can send to both domestic and international investors is that we are ready to change the current trajectory on which we are. I think that if we hold a successful election, we demonstrate to the world and our people that we are willing to change this trajectory on which we are that is leading us further into the abyss. It will restore confidence in the economy. That in itself will send a signal that stabilizes the foreign exchange. <laughs> Currently, nobody has hope in where we are going. And so people are hedging because of the rate of deterioration of the value of the city. People are hedging for other foreign currencies. And when it happens like that, then it puts further pressure on uh, uh, the currency. And so we would instill fiscal discipline because eventually the main driver of the economy is fiscal discipline and fiscal consolidation. And so if you only want to ramp up revenues but you are not willing to cut expenditures, then you have a situation where your budget deficit is out of kilter. And as you know, we had a budget deficit that went as high as 15% of GDP. And unless we instill fiscal discipline, we will continue to have a situation where it puts pressure on our currency. It's like a household budget. You cannot spend more than you earn. And that is what this government has been, spending more money than they earn, borrowing more money than they can afford to pay. And that is what has, you know, created the situation in which we are. So we must reduce the deficit, we must instill fiscal discipline, we must reduce the debt burden, and already there is a debt restructuring going on, and so we must continue the debt restructuring, but make sure that we put in the buffers so that we don't fall into this situation again. In my administration, we set up what we call the sinking fund and we cap the stabilization fund. So any excess money that was above what you go to the stabilization fund went into the sinking fund. We also committed other revenues into the sinking fund so that we could anticipate debts that were becoming due and pay them. This government came and depleted the sinking fund and did not replenish it. And that is how come that we are in the crisis in which we currently are. And so replace the sinking fund, create more buffers so that the economy is more resilient to shocks. The thing about the world is it's unpredictable and shocks will come. But it is how resilient your economy is that will make you be able to come out of the shocks. We all went into the shock together with Cote d'Ivoire. Today our economy is so battered and bruised. And Cote d'Ivoire's economy is much more stable. And I just saw a video of the president waxing lyrical about Cote d'Ivoire in 2016. Today, I don't think he wants to hear that comparison because inflation is lower in Cote d'Ivoire, far lower, single digit, and our inflation is at 25%. Uh, percent. It went as high as 54%. And so discipline uh, is important. But apart from that, part of the reason 
we are suffering is the collapse of the cocoa sector. Cocoa has been a traditional pillar of this economy. And when I was leaving office, we did a syndication, cocoa syndication, of $1.8 billion. The banks had confidence in this country. And so they gave us $1.8 billion upfront to put in the cocoa industry. And this syndication has been going on over the years. Currently, the last syndication we did, we struggle to even make $800 million. I don't think we've, we've received $800 million for the syndication. And so that injection of foreign currency that was predictable and sure, that used to come into the country every year, helped to stabilize the foreign exchange. Today, the cocoa industry is a pale shadow of itself. And so one of the things in the medium term is to revamp the cocoa industry as quickly as possible and make sure that its impact in terms of uh, uh, foreign currency, currency injection is uh, uh, revived. Aside from that, we need to quicken our pace in the oil and gas sector. All of you have heard of the transition to green energy. It is real. It is happening. And so every country that has an oil and gas industry is putting in the maximum investment in order not to have what we call stranded assets. You will have the oil wells, but if that transition is completed, nobody will be interested in putting money to recover that uh, crude oil and gas. These eight years have been wasted completely. In my time, in four years, I worked tooth and nail to bring two new oil wells into production. If you look at the 10 years of oil production, from 2010 when we started oil production till 2016 when I left office, we have earned 3.3, about 3.3 billion dollars from our share of oil production. In the eight years that, because of the work I did to bring two new oil wells, in the eight years that Nanadu and Baumia have been in office, Ghana has earned $7.3 billion. And so in total, over 10 years, over, over the period from 2010 till now, we have earned about $10 billion. Seven point something of it in uh, Abaumi and Akufuado's time, and three point something of it in Professor Mills and my time. For the last eight years, nothing has happened in our oil industry. Not a single drop of oil has been added. Unfortunately, our production of oil has reduced by 32 percent and so we're producing less. So one of the things we'll do is to quicken and attract the oil companies to come back. As I speak, E and I have run away to Cote d'Ivoire because of the unfavorable uh, environment here. ExxonMobil was going to do significant work here because of greed. ExxonMobil decided to pull out because they thought the environment was toxic and corrupt and so they pulled out. So one of the things is to restore investor confidence in the oil field. And there are oil fields and compartments that have been appraised that are just waiting to begin production. And so revamping them and ramping up our oil production and gas will bring in the needed foreign exchange that will help to show up our uh, currency. But we must also look at getting more from our extractives. We have bauxite, we have gold, we have lithium, we have manganese, we have so many other minerals. We will work to make sure that Ghana's share of those extractives is increased so that we can have more foreign currency coming into our country. We produce gold, but because it's not streamlined, a lot of that gold is leaking out and individuals are making the profit instead of the country uh, making it. And so we'll streamline the extractives so that we're able to earn more money. The Vice President's uh, residence, I don't know what the current situation is, but I know that initially when we commenced the idea of creating a suitable residence for the Vice President, the former Nigerian High Commission land was acquired for that purpose. And I know that some construction took place there. Initially, the cabinet, our cabinet was informed that it will cost about $5 million, from what I understand. And so that money was procured and uh, the work commenced. When the new government came, my understanding, I don't know exactly what figure, but they said that it had overrun 
the $5 million. I don't know exactly by how much. But it's news to me that it is going to cost $30 million. I, don't, I haven't seen the figures and all, but um, really, I, 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 I wonder if we have value for money. And that's why I say that in our anti-corruption fight, we will subject any project above $5 million to value for money audits. Because until you audit that project, you can't tell whether it is worth the value for the money we're putting in. And so when we come, we'll look at the figures and we'll do an audit and see whether, yes, $30 million is what is appropriate or it should cost far less. But in these crisis times, one wonders whether that project is really a priority. Because when I was president, the vice president lived in what is currently called the Australia House. And the intention was to finish this and move him there. But in the crisis, maybe it is not something that we should rush to finish. There are many other pressing commitments that we need to look at. But like I said, when we come into office, we'll do a value for money audit and find out whether we are spending more or less. Galamse is a problem of compliance. We have all the laws. We have everything. It's the enforcement that is the problem. And the enforcement is a problem because those who should be enforcing it are part of the problem. Today, DCs and ministers all have small-scale concessions, and I indulge in Ghana say. And that's why I said, any person who serves in my government, if you want to be a gold, small-scale gold miner, go and be a small-scale gold miner. If you're a DC, be a small-scale gold miner. Don't take public office under my administration. And so we're not going to countenance having any of our ministers or our political appointees involved in small-scale gold mining so that we can enforce the laws properly. And what are the suggestions we've given? One, we know the districts where mining takes place. We will open an office of all the agencies that oversee the mining sector in those districts. There must be a minerals commission office in every district where gold mining is taking place so that enforcement and compliance can be right at the doorsteps of the industry in the particular district. The Environmental Protection Agency, there must be an EPA office in every district where mining is taking place. And we have universities that are producing young graduates. UNER is one in Sunyani, uh, UMAT is the other in Takwa. These young graduates are geologists, they are uh, environmental uh, protection uh, uh, specialists. They have a lot of experience when it comes to gold mining. And so we're saying that we're going to identify the concessions and who hold the concessions. And we're going to employ these young people to work with the companies that legitimately own the concessions so that they can guide them in how to do proper mining. We're going to ban mining in forest reserves. As for that, it's not negotiable. The law that was amended to allow people to go into foreign forest reserves, the law that was amended to let people enter forest reserves to do mining will be re-amended to stop it. Because the figures I'm getting are frightening. And that is why the climate change is real. Because our dry seasons are getting harsher. We used to have 365 days rainfall in the western region. Today it is not so because all the forest reserves have been invaded by mining companies. And it's insightful that in the past somebody who was supposed to protect the forest, he himself uh, uh, eventually was known to own about two or three mining companies that had been given permission to go into forest reserves. I think that those trees, some of them 700 years old, some of them older than Ghana, older than our ancestors, are more important than the gold that lie underneath them. And the point is, if we cut all the trees, we will be leaving a barren land to our children and grandchildren. We don't want the forest zone to become the savanna zone. We must protect those trees and rebuild those forest reserves. So we would stop the mining in forest reserves. Uh, the question about... Free SHS. Yeah, free SHS bill. I support any bill that will improve our education. One, to make it sustainable. Two, to afford quality education for our children. And so any bill 
that uh, uh, would achieve this is something that I'll support. I haven't seen the bill, and I don't think that it has been subjected yet to uh, stakeholder consultation. But we would want to see the bill, and I'm sure that when Cabinet has approved it, it will be laid in Parliament. And when it's laid in Parliament, as an, uh, a parliamentarian, the normal uh, uh, action is to refer it to the committee responsible. And I'm, I'm hoping that when that bill is referred to the committee responsible, it will do the proper stakeholder consultation so that uh, we all can be on board. Because if you're making fundamental changes to our educational system, I think that parents, teachers, and everybody who has a stake in education must be involved. I don't know, uh, we're just hearing rumors, and as long as we haven't seen the bill, you cannot say if they're authentic or not, but I think some of the things I've heard is to fuse the JHS and the SHS together. That is a very fun, uh, a fundamental move. And so if you're going to do that, what will the impact be? What do teachers say? What do parents say? What do students say? What do pay, uh, all the stakeholders in the industry say? There are rumors that BEC will be cancelled, and so it's just rumors we've heard. Until we see the bill itself, we cannot make any determination. But like I said, I will support any bill that goes to improve quality and sustainability of our free SHS. Thank you. Uh, but Your Excellency, she also wanted to know what your position on free SHS is. My position on yes, free SHS? Yes, aside the bill. Yes. My position on free SHS is known. In 2015, I launched Progressive Free SHS. That's what the Constitution says. The only difference between us and MPP is the approach. We thought that we should put the infrastructure in place and we should do the necessary preparation to uh, absorb the free SHS. And so we started with day students. We made it free for day students. And in the second year, we absorbed 120,000 students on the free SHS. Nanado himself lauded me. It's there in the media. Just if I had my phone here, I would Google it. He said, Nanado lords Mahamas uh, free SHS. It's there. UNESCO, you know, uh, uh, congratulated us for launching the free SHS. How can a person who launched free SHS be against free SHS? And so it's a political gimmick that is played by our opponents. Free SHS has come to stay. And nobody can roll it back. All we are saying is, let's improve the implementation. Let's take away the bottlenecks. Let's work to abolish the fast track. Let's be able to feed the children better by decentralizing the school feeding, the uh, free SHS school feeding program. So those are all the kinds of initiatives we are thinking about. But we can only take that decision if we come together as stakeholders and discuss freely the challenges that it faces. Today, there is not the environment for a free discussion of free SHS. Ask any teacher or headmaster. If they make comments adverse to uh, the conditions and implementation of free SHS, they are either sacked or they are transferred to Siberia. And so we must, we must change that. We must free them to be able to come up and talk about it and discuss free SHS and how we can improve it. My commitment is to improve it. And so that political gimmick if he comes, he will cancel free SHS. And I've seen some Osofu to going around and repeating the same thing. I don't know if he's, <laughs> I don't know who he is, but he's also gone around repeating that same tired, hackneyed, you know, political propaganda. I am committed to free SHS. I was the one who launched free SHS in this country, and free SHS has come to stay. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be going for the second round. Uh, Ani um, my good brother Shadow is also here. So kindly bring the microphone here. I see Miss Ami here, here. I see Kwame Minka. Then I'll take two here, so that will be six. So um, let's start with Ani Ampofo of Metro TV. Kwame, <laughs> you're seated at the wrong place. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you, Mr. President. So um, my first. Do I have? I'm limited to one. <laughs> All right. So, um, Annie, can you increase your volume? Okay, 24 hour economy. So um, if you check the global countries that are practicing 24 hour economy, it includes USA, Canada, France, UK, um, Singapore, and the rest, Germany. 
all those countries are in the Western uh, developed world. I'm just wondering, I checked the uh, statistics with the France implementation and I think one of their cardinal challenges has to do with labor. So they are hard, I mean largely relying on uh, imported skilled labor now it's, and it's a great challenge in that country. And I'm wondering how it came to you that Ghana being an African country can practice a 24-hour economy compared to these developed countries and how are we going to be able to implement it to meet the standard of implementation by developed countries where we are actually not yet thank you there. thank very you. much um i see that it Pakwisi, i'll come to you all of you i'll come to you but i see the gentleman by your hand it's only fair that i allow that gentleman to ask this question so let's take him i'll come to you thank you your excellency my name is felix Nyava. i work with express news uh, your excellency your critics especially your political opponent, uh, says that you and the NDC cannot boast of any social intervention policies. Uh, will you mind share with us what have you done on this uh, social intervention policies in this country? Thank, Thank you. you. Shandov, uh, bring the microphone to the front. The man in that colorful bow tie, yes. Uh, good evening, Mr. President. Um, my name is Pakwe Sishandov. I work with um, Wesleyan Television. Um, this is my question. When the NDC won the 2008 elections, they were caused by a section of the party, and indeed, the party's found that for the government of the day to be tougher on past corrupt officials. But it appeared that under the impression of Father for All, um, your late boss, Professor Mills, was lenient. And indeed, you've also been accused of that same leniency, if I have to put it that way. But years down the line, I'm inclined to ask, have you delivered yourself from that spirit of leniency? And, <laughs> and if you have, um, what are the first three allegations of corruption that you would probe if elected. I mean, on my paper, it's, there's a plethora of them, but um, in your books, what are the first three that you'd probe? Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the middle lane. Uh, Miss Ami here. Then I'll come to you, Wisdom. I'll come to Wisdom, then we'll go to the fire. <laughs> okay. Good evening, Mr. President. I am Sewa Ami, and I work with the EIB network. So, Mr. President, at a gathering of NDC lawyers somewhere in September last year, you urged them to aspire to become judges so that you can appoint them uh, to bring a balance to the judiciary, which you have termed as an NPP-inclined judges. I want to know if you still stand by this position and if by this you mean that if you become president, you will appoint NDC sympathetic judges or promote them uh, to become judges even at the Supreme Court. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, wisdom. Wisdom. Middle lane. I'll come to the last lane. Okay. My name is Wisdom Heather Jume. I work with the XYZ Broadcasting Limited. Mr. President, um, clearly you have just one term and that will make you unaccountable. I remember very well in your interview with the Voice of America indicated that one term, which is four years, was not enough for any president to make any meaningful impact. So uh, does the position still remain, or can you tell us that would that four years be enough for you to fix the economic mess you've been complaining about? Thank you very much. Let's go to the far end. I see Kuo Usweje. I see Sadek Adams. Um, I'll come to you. So, Koko Usuji, stand on your feet so that they can see you. I see Sadek Adams also there. I'll call you. I've seen all of you, so don't worry. Thank you very much, Sami. Uh, Your Excellency, um, if elected president, I want to find out what measures, specific measures you, have, uh, you would implement to address challenges that was i mean that, that were faced by depositors and investors whose monies are locked up uh, as a result of the collapsed financial institutions including uh men's gold uh, thank you thank you very much uh, all right thank you. um so let's take one more there 
Um, okay. There is one just by you, the gentleman who is stating just by you, yes. Good evening, Your Excellency. My name is Blessed Suga. I work with Joy News. Based on your success in the 2024 general elections, you would not just be the executive president of the republic, you would also be the commander in chief of the armed forces. Um, Your Excellency, there's a professor, Kwesi Enin, who's enjoying support from Imani Africa. They are in court asking the Supreme Court to enforce their interpretation of Article 202 of the Constitution, which will bar any new president from appointing new chiefs for the security agencies, including the IGP. You have a test case if you get to win the elections, which would mean that you have an IGP which is somewhere, uh, I mean, who has an age range of 53. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, what's your personal opinion on you know, the security of tenure for such persons? And will you be willing to work, for instance, with the current IGP if you're elected president. Thank you very much. So that brings us to the end of this set. We have six questions. Your Excellency, we are all ears. Thank you. And um, the first question was about the 24-hour economy and the countries that are implementing uh, that policy. Uh, indeed, there are several countries implementing it, and um, as you said, um, Ghana uh, would probably be one of the first in Africa to begin the implementation of this policy. Um, it is not new. For those of you who have access to the 40-year development program, which was um, passed under my administration, the issue of the 24-hour economy was embedded right in there and it is meant to accelerate our productivity it is meant to increase uh, uh, opportunities for employment and so the example you give for most of those european countries is that they have an aging population because birth rates are falling so low so even as they accelerate their economies with more shifts to increase production, they don't have the labor to be able to uh, service that 24-hour uh, economic policy. We have an abundance of labor. We have young people willing and able to work. And that is the more reason why we even have a better justification to implement the 24-hour economy. But of course, But of course, there are people who come and say, oh, but there's 24-hour economy already. There are some businesses that are working 24 hours. Yes, they are doing that by choice, that just a few of them think that they have the capacity to work 24 hours. So it's just by the decision of the owner of the enterprise that he can implement it. It has never, ever been a policy in Ghana. So the difference between what they're referring to that, oh, some companies are running 24 hours, the difference is that we're going to make it a policy and it's going to have, you know, uh, the guidelines for that policy and what government can do to encourage more companies to run 24 hours. That is a simple thing. And so we say we're going to bring a 24-hour economy policy. Oh, now some more yet than that. But we've never had a policy that regulates and guides how we can incentivize companies to do 24 hours. And I said that one of the things we'll do is give them tax incentives. Because one of the things that adversely obstructs uh, businesses in Ghana is our high taxes. And so if you give some of these companies a tax break, it will encourage them to pump more into production so that they can employ more people. And so that's uh, what we, we also have the issue of safety. Because if companies are working in the night, you must guarantee that they are safe to work. And that is an obligation of government. You don't expect the companies to go and hire security people to come and guard them so that they can work. Government must make sure that it creates a safe environment for uh, the 24-hour economic policy to work. Aside from that, transportation. We need to provide an efficient transport network so that even in the evening, people who have to go to work can get easy, affordable transport to run. And that's why we imported the Ayalulu buses, which today 
are parked in some graveyard. They were never utilized. Government said they didn't have the uh, uh, money to uh, uh, implement it. But it was, a, it was a, a, a combination of interest between government and the private sector. And so GPRT and all of them were involved. And it was going to run as a bus rapid transit system so that people could catch buses to and from work at whatever time that they, they close. And so when we come, we're going to revamp all those uh, bus rapid transit systems and buses. Why the 24-hour uh, economy works in some of the developed countries is at any time of the day or night when you go to a bus stop, you will get a bus to transport you to work. And so government has some obligations under the 24-hour economy. There are many places that we can easily change into a 24-hour economy mode. The judiciary announced recently that, you know, judges are going to set later than they have done. And so it will mean that people have access to justice better than if they set the normal time that they set. If you go to the ports, when the ships come, even at night the cranes are working and offloading the containers. But why can't I go and clear my container at night? Do we need more customs officers? Yes. Must we get more bankers so that we can make our payments and clear our goods even at night? Yes. And so there are things that government can do to make the 24-hour economy possible. Government has its obligations and we are going to make it a policy so that the private sector can come on board and be able to do so. People talk about demand. The demand is there. We import three billion worth of food products every year. And some of these things we can produce ourselves. And so you can't tell me there's no demand. If there was no demand, why are we importing? If there's no demand for vegetable cooking oil, why are we importing vegetable cooking oil? It means that the demand is there. And so if we can increase productivity, we can meet the demand, our domestic demand. But apart from that, we've been giving the advantage of the African continental free trade area. He says, register your brand. As far as I know, Ghana has uh, registered 70 products that it intends to export uh, tariff-free into other countries. We can increase the number of products that we're exporting by increasing demand. We have pharmaceuticals. We have a developed pharmaceutical industry. When I was in government, I gave them money to expand their production to Binko, NS Chemist, Dan Adams, all of them. They have the capacity to increase production and work 24 hours, both to feed domestic demand and also for export. And like I've said somewhere else, we're going to use government's financial muscle to help Ghanaian-owned uh, companies, Ghanaian-registered companies. Because the market, and I'll give an example, the market for pharmaceutical products, if we give a bias towards Ghanaian-made products, and even if they are marginally more expensive than foreign products, we buy them, we're keeping employment in this country. But if we go and bring those analgesics, we bring those antibiotics, we bring those cough syrups from India and other places, we are exporting jobs to those countries. And so we use government's financial muscle to give an advantage to Ghanaian registered companies so that they can produce more and employ more of our young people. And so that's um, uh, to do with the 24-hour economy. Um, I've heard this thing said so many times, and I wonder the basis why they say so. The NDC has no social intervention programs. <laughs> it's the funniest thing I heard. Who brought the District Assembly's Common Fund concept? It was the NDC. We put it in the 1992 Constitution and said 5 to 8 percent of total government revenue should go directly to the districts for their development. So if you go to your district and the district assembly has built a school, uh, a KVIP, a nursery, a sports recreation, a community center, it is a social intervention of NDC that has produced that. Who introduced the GET Fund? It's Rawlings, NDC. We passed the GET Fund law. And but for the GET Fund, where would our education be? Most of the educational infrastructure in this whole country it's been provided through the GET Fund. And so how can you say we haven't introduced social intervention policies? But in any case, what is social intervention policy? It's an action or policy that provides 
social services or social benefits to the people. And so it's not only get fund and other things. We have provided more access to water than any other government in the history of the, the, this country. When Professor Mills came into government, war access to clean drinking water was 58%. By the time we left office, access to clean drinking water was 76%. For Accra alone, we added 40 million more gallons of water. In eight years, not one gallon has been added. And I hear the Ghana Water Company say, oh, Accra is overgrowing uh, its uh, supply of water. It's overgrowing its supply because in eight years, you have not added a single gallon to it. You must plan and know what your population growth rate is. And you must continue to put in the capacity to bring in more water. And that's why I'm saying that we, we took water and brought it in from the northern direction of this country. And so Adenta and other places that had never gotten water for almost 15 years saw their taps flowing for the first time. Today, I'm sure your taps flow twice a week or something. If you don't store water, you will run short. And so we need to invest to bring more uh, water supply, not only to Accra, but to all our growing communities around the country. And so if you are a government and you have invested in improving water, definitely uh, access uh, to people will be denied. We've extended electricity more than any government in the history of Ghana. Electricity is a public good. When electricity arrives in a community, it changes the lives of the people very rapidly. People can en 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 engage in small-scale enterprises. It was Rawlings who introduced the Rural Electrification Program and the National Electrification Program. And so today, when we say that Ghana has more than 80% access to electricity, it's because the NDC introduced those policies for us to be able to do so. So how can any person say that? NDC has not introduced any social intervention. Even the NHIS. NDC started a pilot in Damango and Nkranza for the NHIS. Implementation started in President Kofor's time. But what President Kofor introduced was a mutual health insurance scheme. And so your card, your NHIS card, allowed you to access health services only in the district in which you were registered. Today's National Health Insurance Scheme was introduced by Professor Mills. He changed it from a mutual district insurance scheme to a national health insurance scheme so that your card, so that your card could access health care anywhere in Ghana you go. And so I wonder what is giving these people this uh, uh, idea. <laughs> you know, um, I can refer to free school uniforms and free uh, sandals. The free school uniform policy was introduced by Professor Mills. I can refer to the free textbooks for basic schools. When Nana Jane, seated here, was minister, she came and met a situation where three children had access to one textbook. By the time she left office as minister, every child in basic education had access to four textbooks of their own. If that, if that is not social intervention, I wonder what else a social intervention. Even let's take progressive free SHS. It's a policy, the free SHS. I launched the free SHS. And so you can't say that we have not um, had any uh, social intervention. If you talk about uh, um, uh, uh, the cocoa sector, our policy of free fertilizer and free cocoa inputs and free seedlings changed the lives of the cocoa farmers. And if you remember when I was leaving office, we did almost one million tons of cocoa because of the policy that we had of giving these inputs to the farmers free. If that is not a social intervention, I wonder what else is. That argument must stop. And the point even is, these people have done more harm to social interventions than any other government in history. They capped the NHIS and apart from that, they staffed it of funds. And so most people with an NHIS card today cannot access health services. You go, you get a consultation, there are no drugs, not even analgesics. You go to hospitals and they say they don't accept the NHIS card because the NHIS is not refunding their claims. And it's not refunding their claims because this government has staffed the NHIS of, of money. They've staffed the District Assembly's Common Fund of money. 
the uh, uh, constitution said 5% to 8%. We were giving district assemblies 7.5% uh, of national revenue. When this government came, they reduced it to 5%, and the rest they are putting into the consolidated fund to spend at the center. And even the 5% does not come. If you go and ask any district secretary, he will tell you there is no money. They go begging the MPs to let them have access to the money in their district common fund accounts to be able to do even some of the basic things. And so this government is doing more. Get fund. They collateralize get fund and spend the money in advance. So get fund is not able to continue the projects that it is undertaking because the fund has been collateralized. And so this government has done more harm to the existing uh, uh, social interventions than any other government in the history of the country. And so that is my take on that. And then you ask, have I exercised myself of the father for all, <laughs> the father for all syndrome? <laughs> my boss, my president, was a special person. Um, he several times said he believed in looking forward and not looking into the past. And so I'm sure that people got away with some of the uh, crimes that they had committed against the people. I became president four years later after President Mills had done his four years. I mean, I came into office five months before the election. And so when I became president, it was going to be a bit difficult to be investigating things that happened in 2008. And so I said that, look, any allegations of corruption that are made against any public officer, I give the investigative agencies the free hand to investigate. And so I remember in those times, the National Service uh, investigation, the JIDA, the JIDA scandal, people didn't even forget that I was the one who commissioned the Committee of Inquiry into JIDA. And all the issues that came up, the report was presented to me as president. And I gave the report to the media. And that is referred back to me as my crime <laughs> of condoning corruption. <laughs> The fight against corruption begins with shining sunlight into an area. And that is what I sought to do. And so when we uh, uh, gave the uh, uh, JIDA report to you guys, it was referred to the Attorney General. And the Attorney General began to take action. Some of the people involved went to court to restrain the Attorney General, and the court processes took forever. There were others where there was persecution of my own colleague and friend, Abu Gapeli. The Attorney General put him before court, and he was jailed. It was um, recently that President Akufuado granted him uh, amnesty. And so their will to fight corruption was there. We even retrieved monies from some of those involved in JIDA. We retrieved as much as 50 million Ghana cities at the time. And so the track record is there. And I can assure you, if you believe that I was imbued with the father for all syndrome. It has been exorcised. <laughs> and it's been exorcised because it's a demand by the people of Ghana. The people of Ghana are asking for accountability. And we must create a situation where everybody who agrees to serve must know that he will be held accountable to the people. We can't afford to fail. We've seen some things that are happening in other countries. And let's not think that Ghana is immune from that. And I can tell you our young people are getting frustrated and desperate. And if we don't take drastic action and we think that it's going to be business as usual, we will be shocked at what would happen in this country. And so it's not my demand, it's not a threat, as Nana Jin said, it is a promise that will hold public officers accountable. And it's not going to be only post-regime accountability. It's easy to prosecute your political opponents when they've left office. But the difficult decision of dealing with your own people when they go wrong, it is what makes you pass the test of uh, the fight against corruption. And we're going to hold our people accountable. 
And so I've said it several times, if you get into trouble, I'm not going to be a clearing agent to clear you. If the investigative, if the investigative agencies catch up with you, you are on your own. All right, sir. And the appropriate sanctions will yes, be sir. will be taken. Um, the issue of judges. I believe that our constitution gives the judiciary certain privileges. They are the only arm of government that does not renew its mandates. They don't go for elections to be re-elected as judges. And they're given security of tenure. I think that the obligation and responsibility of every president is to appoint fair-minded people. Human beings, as we are, would have our own inclinations towards one party or towards one religion or towards one culture or other. There are many things that make us who we are. But the obligation on, uh, when you become a judge is to look at the cold hard facts and rule based on that. Some of the pushback that we're seeing currently is the penchant by this president to pack the courts. And only recently, you've seen what happened. And I can't understand why the Chief Justice will be the one recommending, you know, which judges to appoint. The Constitution is clear that it's the president who appoints judges in consultation with the advice of the judicial. And so the initiative to appoint judges must come from the president and submitted to the Judicial Council, it brings it back with advice to the President, and the President uh, forwards it to Parliament. That is the procedure. It is very weird that this time, the recommendation comes from the Chief Justice to the President. And even the issue of capping the number of judges. The Constitutional Review Committee recommended that we cap Supreme Court judges at 15. And so the issue of capping the Supreme Court is not for the Chief Justice to, to say. We will direct the constitutional review process when I become president. And when we do that, we will put it to the Ghanaian people whether we should retain the 15, whether we should reduce it, or whether we should increase it. And so I think that should be the Chief Justice saying that we should increase and cap at 15. And even when she says, uh, and cap at 20. And even when she says cap at 20, she has already recommended the five that will cap. <laughs> the 20. Thank you. And even you. bring it to 21. Because if you add that 5, it will go to 21. And so I think that we must, as much as possible, to have the discretion. The president of this country has a lot of discretionary powers. But that discretionary power must be exercised with responsibility. And make sure that when you are appointing people onto the judiciary, which has security of tenure, until they reach 65 or 70 or whatever age is recommended, you cannot remove them unless for state reason. And so in appointing people to such powerful positions where they are the arbiter of whatever happens in this country, we must make sure that we use a criteria of fair-minded people who can put their prejudices aside and be able to judge fairly because they are the last resort when disputes occur. And so I think that that is the... I was speaking in Elubo when I made the statement that I made. And um, that statement was in 2016. And it was made to justify why I deserve a second term in office. And um, I believe that at that time we had made significant steps in terms of stabilizing the economy, in terms of infrastructure development. We had brought the Echuabo gas processing plant on stream. We had been faced with a crippling energy crisis. We had turned it around by 2016. We had stabilized the power situation. We had worked hard to bring two new oil blocks on stream, which increased the volumes of our oil production and uh, the value of our production. We had introduced a new energy sector levy act, which today is bringing in almost 9 billion CDs a year. And so there were several things that we had done. We had created, established a new port at Tema. 
We had built a new Terminal 3 at our uh, airport. We had expanded the Takradi port. We had expanded educational infrastructure. We had expanded health infrastructure with district hospitals and regional hospitals. We had expanded access to electricity and water. We had built new markets in many places so that we could uh, improve trade and commerce. And so on that basis, I wanted another term to be able to continue and consolidate what I had done. And that's why I made the statement that I did. But um, this time, I come back to the job with experience. And I'm going to hit the ground running. And so even though four years is short, I believe that in four years, we can reset our country. And there are objectives that one wants to achieve. And I say that in four years, we can establish a strong fight against corruption. It is possible for a president to do that. I believe that in four years, we can carry out, begin carrying out constitutional reforms and reviewing our constitution. And that is an objective that I believe I will put myself to and we can achieve in four years. In four years, we can begin to turn around our economic fortunes and stabilize the economy. I don't say that it will become a land of prosperity, but at least we'll turn around the decline, stabilize the economy, and put it back onto a path of growth. In four years, I believe that we can ameliorate and alleviate a lot of the hardship our people are facing currently. Because in stabilizing the economy and stabilizing the currency, we can reduce inflation and reduce some of the hardship that our people are facing. I believe that in four years we can improve our infrastructure. If we uh, implement the big push, we want to put $10 billion over five years in infrastructure development. It will include roads, it will include bridges, it will include the essential infrastructure that will make our country run. And I believe that in four years, with the implementation of a 24-hour economic policy, we can begin to create more jobs for our people. And so, yes, I think four years for the reset objectives that I have mentioned, uh, one can create a turnaround and create a platform for resetting our country and giving it the opportunity to take off. Currently, the prosecution of the men's gold uh, chief executive is ongoing, but I think that it should go beyond the investigation. I don't know how far they've gone with identifying the assets of men's gold and identifying the holdings, validating the holdings that people had. It is only when you've done that and you know what the quantum involved in that you can make you know, uh, promises and assurances of how to alleviate the suffering of Ghanaians. A lot of people really uh, suffered under this men's gold, and many of our uh, public servants and others who were enticed to put their monies in have suffered because of uh, what has happened. And so when we come, we'll accelerate the prosecution of the person involved, but we'll also go one step further to look at what assets are recoverable and see what the quantum of investments that were made. Some people talk about some uh, amounts of money, but I don't have that validation. It's until we have that validation that we can dis uh, make an assurance that uh, some restitution can be made. Um, I'm aware of the case in court, and um, I don't want to comment on it in order that I'm not in contempt of court. But I would say that the security services are different from the public services. And that is why the head of the security services is called the Commander-in-Chief. Security rules and ethics are different from what we have in the public services. And so if you are a Commander-in-Chief and you cannot even change your guard, then, then change the Commander-in-Chief title. And so, without prejudicing what is going on in courts, let's see what the courts say. But I do believe that um, we should be able, if you ask me, 
I do believe that we should be able to put the right people in the right places at any time in order to ensure the safety of our republic. If you do happen to have a security chief who is not effective and because we pass a judgment that the president cannot touch him, it affects the safety of the citizens. And when it comes to safety of the citizens, it is something that we must take seriously. If a public servant makes a mistake, the consequences are not immediate. But if a security chief makes a mistake and we lose a life or people suffer harm, the consequences are irreversible. And so we must look at everything that goes with it. But let's leave it to the wisdom of the courts to make a decision and then we'll decide how we all go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I can see the 2019 Journalist of the Year, Samson Ladi Ayinini here. Um, go to, no, no, no. That side, that side is in a red and black smoke. Uh, my full and brother, Umar Sanda, you are next. I'm a regional balance. Regional balance. Regional balance. Yeah. Parker Wilson, Ashanti Regional, I'll come there. Then the sports journalists are here. Sadiq Adams, you're still here. Um, Michael Utieje, Park with Yasari, I'm coming to you. Um, and, and His Excellency has told me that you'll be extending the time, so don't worry. Senior, the floor is yours. It's, it's refreshing to hear about what could be done about corruption. And Mr. President, when you were voted out, I encountered many civil society leaders who said the corruption was endemic and extending the time of the NDC would mean the corruption will get worse. I hear the same civil society leaders repeat the same thing, that at least one benefit we can get as a country is not to keep a government in for eight years because the corruption will get bad. I don't believe that we must get to elections before we can get what we deserve. I believe citizens' power ought to be exercised without the kind of repression we see with the police today so that a young man, a PhD, Oliver Bakavomawo, is facing prosecution, staging a coup on Facebook. That ridiculous thing. I don't know if you will instruct your Attorney General to file a nolly prosecutor to stop that nonsense. Now, you kept repeating reset, reset, reset. I believe it must be a very important word to you. In Kenya today, there is a reset and the citizens are forcing it. 47 corporations, S S SOEs, are being dissolved. 50% of the president's advisors are losing their jobs. My question to you is, eight people were killed in elections in 2020. We are four years down the line. Those lives must matter. Over 200 people in Ashaiman were brutalized by the army, and I wrote about this as state-sponsored terrorism against them. 180 of them were arrested by the military, manhandled and released without anything. As we speak, nothing has happened. What have you done as the opposition leader about these things? Thank you. What will you do about these situations? Thank you very much. You see, I've given you a lot of time. So when I come on news file, kindly return <laughs> the favor. Uh, Omar Zanda. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sami. Um, good evening, Mr. President. Um, my question is, we are at the Kempinski Hotel, a few meters from here. There's a hole that has been described variously <laughs> as the world's, most, the world's most expensive hole. My question is, when or if you become president, will you cover that hole, <laughs> complete the hole, 
or convert the hole? That's my question to you. And just across the street from that hole is the Office of Special Prosecutor. What's your plan with the OSB? Thank you okay. so much. For this round, I'm going to stay here for a while. I see uh, Yatiti at the back. So let's go for a woman. My papa chow good evening, my country. And Your Excellency, my papa chow me question no Yanubo Chi, mame, papa with all permission. Thank you. Abandoned projects. Me tia say the entire abandoned be able person starting a day. Near the taxpayers' money, ako bobo singa. Now projects ni si wana pro. Look at Sagleme. E blocks. Basa. At the end of the day, a car ya dear ne ye IMF no. E ye sa bosiana ya bona ya ye project S C wa. Yen si mi complaint in a dear druha. Enti me pacho your excellency. Abandoned projects. Wo big push, you know. Also wo be started for fro. Ana de wo hon wo be ye. And I feel so um port. Yet you have taxi beer, sebe, sebe, nyan send him. And a Toyota Viz, Unkita seventy to eighty thousand a winter mentor. I don't know why we are here. It's in my patch or the end now, obey you because you are better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Alaska, Ahoto FM. Alaska, I'm coming to you. I'm staying here for a while. From here, I'll be coming here. I see Samuel Wontokwa, Menka, Erika here, and your Bernard right. Avile. I know he has a question. Uh, he has a laptop in front of him. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alaska De Don with Ahuto FM. Uh, Mr. President, my question has to do with uh, our universities. Most of the times, we normally talk about uh, free SHS without talking about the tertiary institutions, especially the universities. But there are a lot of challenges and problems there. My question is, what are you doing when you are voted for as a president of this country with regards to problems going on at the tertiary institutions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we've taken a lot. Okay, Benjamin Akakpo. I see you at the back. Benjamin Akakpo of Joy News. Thank you very much. I have one question in two parts. Your Excellency, you spoke about the Tema Oil Refinery in May. You made mention of the fact that you would revamp the Tema Oil Refinery and that some of its problems are actually because it's a state-owned enterprise. I want to know what exactly is the plan. I feel the Tema Oil Refinery is a blot on our national conscience. What exactly is the plan? And feeding into that, you spoke about reliable internet. The last I recall, we had GhanaSat1 launched in 2017, decommissioned in 2019. But if you paid attention to the recent internet shutdown and the concomitant effects, you would realize that we are susceptible to some of these challenges. Is your administration going to consider low Earth orbit satellite technology to ensure that we can have internet stability? Thank you. Thank you very much. So before I move here, those of you here who still have questions, can I see you by hand? Okay, do me a favor. Can you, is it okay to stand this way? Yes. Where, can you stand in the aisle for me so that I know that you are the ones left? Once we do you, we know we are done with here. No, if you can come and stand this way. Yes, in the aisle. Just for a few minutes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay, you go back to your seats. I think the number is huge. I underestimated underestimated it the number is you so you you you, you sit for a while i'll come back let's go to parker wilson from ashanti regional Europe. thank you very much Sammy. yes in fact uh, thank you for recognizing the importance of regional balance thank you very much uh, your excellency you spoke a little about how you're going to deal with corruption uh when of course in your next government but then your critics say you are only flexing muscles with the wind because as an individual, you've been accused of your flirtation with the Airbus scandal. Okay. I want to know um, how you would respond to your critics when they say that uh, your corruption activities led to the Airbus scandal. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take one last one, and that will bring the total to seven. Um, okay, another person from Ashanti region, Ufuri from Mercury FM, Ashanti region. Thank you very much, Sammy. Your Excellency, my name is Oforiata. 
I work with. <laughs> Please, I'm the innocent one. I'm not the notorious one. <laughs> Don't be scared at all. I'm not the notorious one. <laughs> Please, I can assure you that everybody is in safe hands. I'm not a notorious all one. All right, we are all yes. Okay. I work with a class media group, specifically Kumasi FM and Adishi FM in Kumasi. Your Excellency, some times past, a member of this government died, and in his will, it became known that he had devised a plot of land in Achimota Forest for a relative, as if that was not enough. Now, there is a problem between the organized labor and government in respect of uh, state hotels which are on the verge of being given to a cabinet minister. This week, a minister of state did tell parliament that an amount of 399 Ghanaian cities had been spent on the pit called the National Cathedral. At a time that what is seen and felt on the faces of the Ghanaian youth are homelessness, hopelessness, and joblessness. My question is that when you are elected into office, what will you do to one, stop the reckless and irrelevant state capture by government officials, and also two, to restore confidence in the faces of the Ghanaian youth? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it's been too much politics, so I'll take Sadiq Adams. I know his question will be on sports. And His Excellency says you will be crisp with the answers for this round, so that's why I'm taking more. Yes. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and good evening, Mr. Uh, His Excellency, the former president. Uh, my question is, Sami uh, said on sports. Mm -hmm. As a nation that prides itself as a sports nation, we currently do not have any world class or international category A stadium in the whole of Ghana, despite millions of dollars sunk uh, as creating infrastructure for the sports. Uh, what is Mr. President's vision in getting the best of infrastructure to unearth talent and to tie that in with the 24-hour economy? We travel around and see that sports is a very massive part of nightlife in uh, countries even in Africa, but Ghana sports is designed that after 6 p.m. we all go back to sleep because of the lack of facilities and other amenities to enhance the creation of jobs in the night uh, for sports. What is or how is the 24-hour economy designed? I've heard from our great trade business. How will that capture and affect sports so that we have around, uh, around the clock sports development and enhancements in the country? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'll just um, add a few things to what I said about uh, free SHS. One of the objectives we would uh, set ourselves in terms of um, looking at the implementation again will be to allocate dedicated funding for free SHS. If we agree that education is the most important driver of prosperity and growth, then we must be prepared to identify and earmark funds for it. We already have get fund which goes into infrastructure, but we must find dedicated funding to be able to implement the free SHS seamlessly. Um, also, in addition to the question I answered in terms of four years, I have heard um, somebody say that uh, four years, uh, if somebody has eight years, he'll be more responsible and accountable and if somebody has four years, he will not be accountable. I mean, it's the most illogical statement I ever heard. We were the same person said four more for Nana. And so, if you follow that logic, it means that no president deserves a second term. That's what, what the person is saying. So even your eight years you are talking about, it means when you win and you want re-election, you're not going to be accountable. And so, let's, you know, put that illogical uh, thinking aside and, and look forward. Um, 
The first was about um, the prosecution of the laptop coup um, in, in uh, regards to our colleague uh, uh, Baka Vomao. And um, I do think that um, the, I don't want to uh, be in contempt of, of law, but I can say on authority that I don't think that that prosecution was necessary. And so let me just keep it like that so that I don't uh, uh, get cited for contempt. I think that prosecution was unnecessary and um, it was an overreaction by the government. With regards to uh, what is happening in Kenya, I don't think that we have to wait for the backlash of what the youth did in Kenya for us to do the things that we have to do. And that's why I started talking. I said, look, the time has come for us to act and that it can't be business as usual. The Kenyan youth have sent a signal to the whole of Africa that they will push back if the leaders don't do the right thing. And so definitely I'm signaling that it will not be business as usual in our new administration. We'll cut out waste, we'll cut out opulence, We'll bring a code of conduct for public sector, uh, public appointees, especially political appointees, in how they behave in terms of their modesty, in terms of their humility. Your appointment to that office is an opportunity to serve. It's not an opportunity to lord it over the people. And so our political appointees and public office holders must change their attitudes. And so that is what we're going to insist on, that people that we appoint are modest people, they are humble, they will open up to the people, and they'll do the things that will make the lives of our young people better. And so we're going to hold them to a higher criteria of service than, they have, uh, than people have been held to in the past. And that's why I say if you, uh, you agree to serve, you must serve and not have other side businesses and do other things. You must not go and buy state property. Anybody serving in my government will not be allowed to buy a state asset. Nobody serving in my government will buy a state asset. Vehicles or cars or buildings or land or anything, nobody serving in our government will be allowed to buy a state asset. With regards to the deaths, I I have the same opinion as you. Eight of our citizens died for no reason. And our president has not even extended any recognition of what had happened. And no attempt has been made to investigate. I have said in, in, in several places that we'll investigate what happened and find out those culpable for those deaths. And aside from that, we'll compensate the families adequately on the loss of their loved ones. And it's not only the deaths during the election. You mentioned there are shaman brutalities. It shouldn't have happened. I mean, a soldier was killed, very unfortunate, by a group of armed robbers. And because of that, a whole community was subject to um, brutal brutalization. I don't think things like that, you know, uh, should happen in the 21st century. And so, I put out a statement when it happened, you know, um, condoning with the, condoling with the victims and um, also asking the military to exercise uh, patience. I believe that the military work in a very difficult environment. They are responsible for our safety and security. But at the same time, they should recognize that the money the taxpayers pay, that put them in that uniform and give them those instruments are to protect the citizens and are not supposed to be used to brutalize the citizens. And so we need to see how we deal with that. Ayawasu West Wagon, a whole commission of inquiry was set up. Government has with impunity refused to uh, implement the recommendations of the committee. Only recently I visited one of them. He was a footballer. He is unable to go back to work or do anything because of the infirmity in his leg. And so I went and presented a freezer, a flat screen TV, and 5,000 CDs uh, to him 
in order to uh, help him uh, keep going. And I believe that people like that should be adequately compensated so that they can uh, live their lives again. I am a Christian and I belong to the Assemblies of God Church. Ordinarily building a house of God is something that we all do. I contributed monies in my local Assemblies of God branch to build our church. And it's created an environment for us to praise and worship our God. But I don't condone stealing in the name of God. And that is what has happened in the case of this National Cathedral. It is instructive that members of the Board of Trustees, some of the members of the Board of Trustees, have resigned and they have called for a forensic audit of the National Cathedral. I'm not saying it. Members on the board believe that fraud has been perpetrated against the people of Ghana and they are calling for a forensic audit. At the time this National Cathedral came up, it was somebody's personal commitment to God. And we are sure that public funds were not going to be used for the National Cathedral. Unfortunately, we hear that 300 and something million has gone into it. Where did those payments go? Were they justified? Who did they go to? These are all things that we have to unravel. And I think that that is the first thing we do before we even decide what to do with that huge pit. And so first, let's investigate and do a forensic audit. And if people have, you know, illegally and unlawfully taking the monies of the people of Ghana. They must be made to uh, re 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 refund those monies. And so that's the first thing I'll do with regards to the cathedral. question <laughs> Adia, a ya ye ye, se a bind a ba na a shas ye and name Puntun Juma, a will be bibi bray, a be a market and a school and a hospital. Who may also abide for a bar na a chess, a mood drink, se a mood discussion one. Credit no ever call a binder than in chain. Into no more trebu, na a man can some mark or share or modia say. Now make a set, send your mea dom near bar. Sika ye war. Yeah, the best yes, sir, in Jum uh and Puntun Jumani Bibria Aka. I try say ye tree go na ye de sika shemun yet me we say in Jumano. Asani asha say any for fro. And to make a said district be a bear inventory of all projects are I just uh a buying a ba a buying a co ni na omweja ebu ho. Na every year budget I be a bea ye be yi sika gun chain. Ah, I try say ye de baby say in Jumano into four years, sir. Mewa Bemwa Mayor President on Afibia Ye Discabe to Ho Senebeya every district in Juma a Wahwa a Chese uh ye ja atun room no ye decise cano a betwaso na ye ye and sanya sha sene for fro. Because who could be bria classroom block yin ye ube who not assembly a case oh ye sha sene a classroom block for fro. And Kasika, you want to yamfen ye nya yin ye no, and sani asha say any for fro. And tia no me no yard dream, say abandoned projects, I was here na ye ye. Um nya oka can ho any taxes and levies. Ampa oshe a dear bakwa amma gana kani na ye say ye ye favorite destination for investment. And they say na your taxes ne levies e wo form kakra and so afen so de em se senya aban ama your economy no ahwe ase no imf program a omoko mu no imf akachro mu se yeto a yeje anasa revenue a ye nya no e wo se ye pega e ko dru 24% Kane near or fifteen per cent. Taxes are almost there two years. We a pay ya ya by seventeen point something per cent. And so almost by twenty twenty eight, I will see you drew twenty four per cent. In the church, I omunya ye, sir, taxes now with the guay so no. And ya and drew a pempensoa, ya beca say, omu ye. Anything now on person, omode vats at electricity. So that was one of the reasons. 
And so when you say to use a more, I could see a year, and by now electricity bill be a and can vats a dash. Young Kwani or mine are a woo ya see her in a chess yare, a ba a co, a yeji a co, a fasa yare no COVID levy. COVID a ba a co, China be a COVID a free impo, ye and geomo COVID levy. And so Ghana Kwani a j COVID levy. And it's an your man who emissions tax, and it's our taxes nina, a year to a buying a day two years. So as a result of IMF agreement, on my year. And you know, because say, oh, me ba me cha a tour no more. Who are buying no more this year? So we me cha tour no more. Shase me cha a number to a tour number from near you. Men can say, oh, monto ma mi ansa me ba sa a tour me me year for you. Enti niawo kano ne no kreno no. One of the things I be any say, you be streamlining that because me tia say say obe ko a jum na encrofor mi ansa eton adie. Bakun e ye vat three percent. Bakun ne vat e was rokakra. Bakun so vat ye twenty one percent. Meanwhile, obe ni na the same customers. And he said, "Me ba o hona o be jimi va twenty one percent a me ko ni o be jimi three percent no." And he also streamlining so that traders in Ghana will pay the same rate in terms of value added tax. I think so. We call port wa send your kind no Toyota vet. And then we need go to Fushia. Me fa an example of car bia ubia import and na me kind levies and taxes a waso. About 23 levies and taxes. So, what has a duty? Any sign your manner? I know you were harmonized ECOWAS tariffs. Into duty, no one to me in your country. But the problem is the levies and port charges. It be illegal. Into now, me see a bar. We rationalize all those levies. The only say we want to be here for you. Send a bear. I be my two number from Kakra. But the major thing I was saying, they say. We have to stabilize the currency because it will affect the BR. One of the reasons I'm confused soon, and I said this week we back up. Now currency, no. Yes, the Bank of Ghana say currency, no. Exchange rate, no. Yes, say. In this hour, we're on the budget report. The next week we back up. Now see the a free a be a fourteen above fifteen. In this hour, we're on a bit here in see this, no. Next year, say a cost row. Into one of the priorities of government will be to stabilize the currency and stabilize the economy. Send a bear, Obia, Asumbe, Jono, and to M. C. M. Y. A. Memanono. Universities, uh, what are we going to do about tertiary educational institutions? There are many challenges there. One of them is that students don't have enough hostels to live, and so they have to go for private uh, hostels, and the private hostels are expensive. And so one of our objectives in our manifesto will be to accelerate the building of hostels. And we're going to do that with private sector. The universities have lands. And so we can engage the private sector to build hostels. And we and them will agree on the fees that should be charged in the hostels. The government alone cannot build all the hostels to accommodate the students. But there are Ghanaians who have investable funds that they can use to provide hostels. If you go to the investors today, what they'll take you through in terms of uh, eligibility to build a hostel, they want to see your bank balance, they want to see this, they want to see, I mean, so many things. It makes it difficult for the private sector to come in. But if we apportion uh, some land in every university and say people who want to invest in wholesales should apply. We'll go through the criteria fairly and transparently and allocate the lands for them to build so that our students can get accommodation. That will be one way of doing it. Aside from that, we'll uncap the GET Fund. This government has capped the GET Fund. And so any money that exceeds a certain statutory threshold goes into the consolidated fund. And so the GET Fund is not receiving enough money. Apart from that, 60% of the GET Fund has been collateralized with the Dachi bond. And so only 40% of a capped GET Fund is available to continue projects. And so we'll uncap it and we'll uh, uh, liquefy the GET Fund so that it's able to continue to do the work it's doing. To ease the pressure on students, we will enhance the student loan scheme. 
Recently, I heard the administrator of the student loan scheme say there's a 50 million Ghana cities funding gap. And so they are not able to accommodate all the students in terms of the loans that they give. And so government must enhance the loan scheme so that the quantum is enough to be able to take the students through, but is also able to uh, cover uh, uh, as many students who need that support as possible. And so those are some of the things we'll do for um, uh, uh, tertiary education. TOR is a shame and a disgrace to our country. This was a flagship project by President uh, Nkrumah, and it was one of the first refineries to be built in Africa. Today, TOR is a pale shadow of itself. When I came, I did my best. I restarted TOR. They started refining uh, products. Indeed, before I left office, our first shipment of crude from our own oil field was given to TOR to refine. And then we left office. The new administration came. That shipload of oil sat in the tanks for years. Eventually, they discounted it and sold it out. And TOR hasn't worked since then till now. All TOR is surviving on is the revenue it gets from the uh, single uh, uh, boy mooring facility that offloads petroleum products and their storage tanks. That's all. Aside from that, the refinery has not been working for almost more than six years of this government's administration. And so when I say we'll come and we'll revamp TOR, it's because it is an important industry for the growth of Tema. It's an important industry for the prosperity of Tema. And there are a lot of young people who can find jobs with a refinery that is working. And so we'll strategically work with any strategic partners who are available to revamp the refinery and even expand it. Tor has extra land to accommodate even another refinery. And so if we have people who are ready to invest with us, we would let them come on board. We will have a stake. They also will have a stake. And do not only revamp TOR, but if they can even build an additional refinery to increase the capacity of TOR, it will be a good thing to provide employment and it will also make the cost of our petroleum products more predictable. Because if we are refining the crude oil ourselves, we can lower the cost of petroleum products. But if we are importing from outside, we must accept whatever price we get on the international market. Um, fiber cuts. Yes, optic fiber got cut and the uh, internet was disrupted. We have several submarine cables that, you know, provide service to Ghana. We don't know exactly what happened, but there was an undersea cut that affected the cables. And so they've been repaired now, and so we can have connectivity. But luckily, technology is always progressing. And so the cost of satellite internet has come down. And due to Elon Musk and his Starlink and other such producers, you can buy a Starlink dish and get internet connectivity. And so it gives us a quantum leap to be able to send internet connectivity to places that we didn't dream of before. And so in our schools, in our government offices and other places, we can go and put these satellite dishes there and give them instant connectivity. And the rates are uh, quite affordable. And so many private people have even started using satellite internet. And so the technology gives us more possibilities to create universal access in our country. We even have domestic fiber cuts. When they're doing road uh, construction, they cut the fiber links. And so we also must be careful how we protect the fiber uh, that we have. Um, let's see what else. I think we are done. Achimota Forest. <laughs> Achimota Forest and Airbus. <laughs> yeah, That's Achimota Forest. Yes, sir. I mean, a lot of allegations were thrown against me. I've been out of office for seven years and seven months. You think that if this government had anything they could stand on with how they hate my persona, they would not have prosecuted me for it. Airbus, the president referred it to the OSP, and the OSP is supposed to investigate it. You don't expect me to investigate myself. And so 
if they had something to stand on, I would not be standing here today. The same thing, hotel in Dubai. I challenged them. I said, let's go and find that hotel. I myself am in need of money. We'll find it. We'll sell it. You give me my small share, and government can take the rest. Till today, $10 million for diaries. President Akufuado himself said it, that my government has spent $10 million to import diaries. They've been in office for 7.7 .7 years. Where is the $10 million for diaries? And so I've challenged the MPP and the mud slinging and the lies they've told about me at every juncture to come up with proof of the allegations and prosecute me. I am an adherent of accountability. And I've said anybody who serves in public office should be prepared to be accountable. And that accountability must start with myself. And if they have any allegations that they could prove, they would have done so by now. It's just a political gimmick. When elections are coming, then they start raising all kinds of issues and all that kind of thing. But I remain focused. My commitment is to fight corruption. And if I come into office, I'll hold their administration to the high standard of accountability. And those who serve in my administration would also be measured by the same yardstick. Yes, And then uh, Forest and looting of uh, state lands and others. I've said that no person who accepts to serve in my administration would be allowed to buy any state assets. When you finish serving and you go and you want to do whatever, it's your palaver. But as long as you are an appointee under my administration, uh, buildings, lands, vehicles that belong to the state, you are not going to be allowed to buy or invest in any state asset. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. So, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that time is fast spent. Um, I, only, I can only do one last round, and um, we will call it a day. But His Excellency has told me to assure you that we are going to have this media encounter again very soon. Sir, that is right, right? So we're going to have the last round, because... Uh, uh, and so after this round, His Excellency will give you the answers... We will do the vote of thanks and the closing prayer. But I would like to appeal to all of us to remain in our positions. My sister, the spokesperson for His Excellency, Joyce Mukhtari Bawa, has an important announcement for all of us, which we don't want to go out. So that is what is going to happen. Now, I see... Um, okay, I see Captain Smart. I, I, I'll come here. I'll come here. Captain Smart, Captain Kwajo Smart, is he here? I'm here. Yeah. Uh -huh. He's in the middle lane, yes. I'm yes. here. Bernard, I'm coming to you. Yes, so Captain. Um, Sami Medasi. Your Excellency, my person, my country. The Edikan is a fourth republic, Yehun Rollins, Yehun Kufo. Yehu Professor Mills, who are Yehuda, have a demon penny, Yehuna Nebuchadnezzar, and they are winning. It sounds like Yen T. B. B. Fufru Bia, as I say, Yehuna, your son could be a tree, the attitude that the Nana, who can say, then Pan, ya at the Fufra, who second coming, no. A woman says a gunner for you, ye dear tree. Thank you very much. Oh, try and say, Chicky, last one for you, so so. But your work can say, What be a move for no? Umma ubia and talk gun a japadi. Now, one 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 who says here on what tono. Obey one day. Now, for banks in a good no. Uba what they want license in a bema one and answer one farm my own. But I say, Thank you. Um, Kodjo Yangsen. I see somebody here, Kodjo Yangsen. I'm coming. <laughs> Thank you. Do that. Your Excellency, if I may say, this is a very good idea, and I hope you do stick to your promise to keep having such events. And My question If you win in December, do you still intend to grant an amnesty to the repentant Galamseers? 
All right, thank you. Pakwezi Asari, you've had your hand up for a long time. Pakwezi Asari. Yeah. Yes. All right, uh, thank you very much. My name is Pakwezi Asari. I work with uh, Media General. So recently the IEA was calling for a law that will prolong the the term of the governor of the Bank of Ghana to exceed that of the tenure of the president. I know the, that's the status quo. Um, I think um, the governor has four-year term, which is contaminous with that of the president. Uh, if you have the chance to renew the contract of the Bank of Ghana governor, would you do that? And you had several called for a cabinet reshuffle. You had asked the president, Anadu Dango Akufado, to reshuffle his finance minister. He did that, and you never applauded him. Why? Thank, thank you very much. Um, ben Alavile. Okay, let's see. Thank you very much, Sami. Thank you, Mr. President. I think there are two pending questions that were forgotten. The sports question, and then the Umaru Sanda question on OSP. So my question is, you, you said that you, you can work with 60 ministers, which, which is interesting. The number of DCs has increased from 110 to 261. And it appears when districts are created, the EC also increases the constituency. So now we have 275. Those are also arms of government that are expensive. Now while this is happening, the AMA had nine districts created out of it in 2018 to 2019. So we are increasing districts, we are creating new districts even in AMA, but AMA has only three sub-metros, so the ability to raise revenue is also lower. So it's a two-in-one question. Are we going to stop at 261 districts, 275 constituencies, cutting costs? And within that same question, the issue of AMA becoming only three sub-metros. They can't raise enough revenue. So it's difficult to manage the city. You've spoken about building a new capital. Does that mean a crisis and lost cause? Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, Charles Okran of Daily Graphic. Charles Okran of Daily Graphic. Yes. Good evening, Your Excellency. Please, we've had, heard you talk about a lot of programs and policies, but we find ourselves under a very watertight IMF policy. Under a Jane John John Jane uh, uh, administration, would you review? The, would you ask for a review of the of the IMF program with us? Thank you. All right, bring the bring the microphone to the front bench. Uh, there is a lady here who has a question. It's important. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Finally, on behalf of the women, I was about to start a gender protest, but um, thank you, Sami. Uh, Your Excellency, good evening and thank you for your time. My name is Nuong Falong. Um, I've heard you outline certain intentions towards gender equality. What I have not heard is the Affirmative Action Bill, which we believe is a critical accelerator towards gender equality. Mm. Do you have specific, targeted, mm. special commitments towards the Affirmative Action Bill. I can bill. see Shamima Muslim Thank smiling. Thank you. Um, um, Kemini, I, I was told that you, ha you had a question. Kemini of uh, TV3. Uh, gender balance. I think she, is she at the back? Let's give more females. Yes. yes. Okay. Your friend and now major Kumeke Chi. It's about the general election. Um, 2016, Yehudi Your Excellency, Satan Wunana Owa Baimu. Yes. Midnight mm -hmm. after 7 December, wow. Madam Charlotte said, "Be announced say almost system no, um, ya hacky into the system." And then maybe see. And then 2020 general election, so you would see till today. I'm say be sex results and electoral commission, Madam James, I announced why you name the specific one. And now the Dan Kwaku Fadu Edi Winnie 2020 general election. So sometimes no anchor for Ebisa say, Otua Bano Kra, it will be difficult for NDC to protect our vote. Thank you very much. Um, Randy Haji, you've had your hand up for a long time. Randy Haji. And then we take one last one. <laughs> I'm very sorry that. All right, thank you. you take My name is Randy Haji, Wazor TV. Uh, Mr. President, um, it's been six years now the whole airport uh, was completed. Uh, it's in a sorry state, I must say. The last time we had a commercial flight there was in 2022. 
And per my checks, we have spent close to a little over 2 million Ghana cities uh, in terms of maintenance in the last two years. Yet, the place can be best described as a white elephant. Mr. President, what will you do in your next administration to ensure that the whole airport uh, gets some revitalization? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Kwame uh, Wusu Danson, the gentleman in black, will have the last one for this round. I'll defer to my colleague. I think my question has been asked already. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. So then let's go to the far end. Let's go. The lady, Rebecca. Yes. You've had your hand up for a long time. Thank you very much, Sami. My name is Rebecca Iwa. Your Excellency, please, should you win the 2024 election, what will be... Um, the measure that you put in place to ensure that the people of Ada get their livelihoods back. I'm talking in relation to the issue where a single investor has been giving the whole Songo Lagoon and the people are deprived of their livelihoods and their brutalities and uh, freedom of the press is under attack. What exactly would you do to protect our natural resource should you come into power? Thank you very much. This brings us to the end of the questions segment. His Excellency will give us the last round of answers and then we shall wrap up. But sir, first, you have a question on sports from Sadiq Adams which skipped you. So if you could start with that. Men's good in the past. Um, I'm sorry I missed the question on um, sports. And one was um, whether we intend to provide a world class sports stadium. It says that we don't have a world class standard sports stadium. Um, we've been to several countries, we've gone to watch matches. I've been to Wembley before. and. Um, it's a stadium of a different class from what we have here and um, often countries are energized to build this stadia if you bid to host something it creates the opportunity because you know that you get returns on the investment when the tournament comes to your country and so if I remember when uh, we bid for the African Cup of Nations, some rehabilitation of stadia took place, but we didn't see any new uh, world-class stadium, stadium built. In the current crisis in which we are, I would not stand here and promise that we will build a new stadium. But I've said that under the big push, we intend to spend a certain amount of money over five years on providing work, uh, a good infrastructure to include roads, bridges, uh, agro-industrial parks, and so on and so forth. Um, that could include uh, sports facilities. And if we make a location, then we probably would look at uh, uh, providing such a stadium. And so um, that's what I can say. Sports, if you go to many countries, sports plays a very good part in the 24-hour economy and so you find games being played at night and the floodlights and so on and so forth unfortunately here in many places we have to close the match before the sun goes down otherwise there's not enough light to continue the match because we can't even keep the floodlights on and so i do think that as part of the 24-hour economy sports can play a very good part and will invest uh, in sports facilities and help the uh, 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 people engaged, the private sector engaged in sports facilities to be able to provide, you know, service at night so that our people can enjoy uh, uh, that service. During the working day, people go to work and things. In the evening, they want to go witness a football match or go uh, witness, witness an athletics meet. And um, we don't have exactly the facilities to sustain that. And so it's something that we will uh, think about. Minyanu Bisa said, I'm going to be a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a 
uh, Ghana for Shebre as a son. Now, I'm saying, and you might be brave, Makano. Makacho said the central plank of your economic, uh, economic policy initially is to stabilize the economy and only the priority. Because we be a Tokrumu Ayako Sheno, I was say, Yetimi a year, na Yetimi a PA free Tokrumu, and Sana Waka Bibiaka, and America said 24 hour economy, no, and no, a big economy, no, send a bayer. And Kodan Benye Jumaya, Yamabun Benye Jumaya, because national security, like I say, the major threat to your stability in Ghana is your youth unemployment. Abraham Miwa Bemu, now unemployment rate, yeah, a little over 8%, and the unemployment I could do 14.7%. And we share Ghana statistical standards, uh, 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 Ghana statistical uh, uh, service, or more reports now. And she says, I need to be in Tema. Things will deteriorate further because World Bank say 800,000 people have fallen below the poverty line just because of economic crisis. I hear from we. Another Ghana Statistical Service report say 8 million of our people ended that back home because they couldn't afford to eat. 8 million people did not eat for one day because they couldn't afford uh, food. Ain't it the major emergency I work on is say. I was say yet the food inflation ever from. And the only way we can do is ne say Yan Kasa E Dyania ye dino. I was say Yan Kasa ye Dyawha na ye cha na ye and crow forty minya food at affordable cost. Ain't it San Yomani na e ya dear uh uh me ya yebe ya ebema and yoma asasa a my um na osan besides say say a ba and your ma and crofo afa and also maybe a year a year or mine a japa dear a omon kwa omo afa no ye be any day em se makan wo bebe bebe na nu ya me call la na la fo no omu su because omo asa si bebe a abay nji ye se e de ye bebe ene ma ye mo adwen se mo mfan nye biyo na emrani chile se se wo se wo mfan nye e wo mfa sa asa se ne nye a dia wo ji ye ninti Umfanye biuma, I was say Uma Asaseno Esan Ko Nya or the Asaseno Mao. And they can say La Wireless. Make I say President Kufo FAB forty per cent EDC African Union Village because na yeah be ye African Union Summit or ha. In Tina ka sixty per cent of La Wireless land and ne kohokoshe ya che asasinafa without consultation with the stakeholders. Make I say a brab of some mills by international students who sell near Chedi in Alpha. Professor Mills by or just has us in the back and a honor foreign ministry. A C. Sasa Seno Sona foreign ministry. Ain't he say what fat a buyer japa dear a walk quine so a mrano and penia? Ye bet ye best I on behalf of the people of Ghana. And I know a commitment I just say may ye at them. Will I still give amnesty to people convicted for galamsey? And my answer is yes. Because those who are in prison for galamsey are not the actual perpetrators of galamsey. The big kingpins are not in prison. Those who are in prison are the small boys that they employ to work on their galamsey concessions. And so they are victims of circumstances. And so if we are coming with a new fight against galamsey, let's start by giving them amnesty, let's bring them out, reform them, and do the things that will make them not go and do what they've done again. If it's somebody must be in prison, it's those district chief executives and ministers and others who are doing the galamse, not the people they are employing. <laughs> the term of uh, Bank of Ghana governor used to overlap the political season. It is only, it's a four-year contract, but it depends on when the governor is appointed. And so if you remember, the last governor who was a governor in my time was Governor Isaku Nashiru. When I left office, Nashiru's term was still running. It was the same with uh, Governor Aqua. His term overlapped government. It is only when Nashiru was forced to resign and a new governor was appointed. That's the term is becoming contaminous with the political season. 
But otherwise, really, it just says you have a four-year contract. After four, year contract is, uh, after four years, the contract is renewable. And so if a government comes into office and your contract has not expired, you continue as governor. And when the time comes and your contract is over, depending on your performance, your contract will be renewed. But if you are a governor who presided over a 60 billion loss, I wonder if you expect a contract extension. If you are a governor who printed 42 billion CDs and pumped it into the economy, pushed inflation to 54%, I wonder if you expect that you will get um, a, a contract ex extension. If you're a, gov a governor who in crisis decides that the best thing for a bank to do is to invest $250 million in a headquarters building, I don't know if you should have the expectation that your contract will be extended. And so I think that, yes, four-year contract, but it must be based on the performance of the person or the individual who is in that office. Cabinet reshuffles are important because they enabled you to bring fresh pair of hands into your gov government. And then somebody might not be performing in a certain sector. But if you reshuffle him and move him to another sector, you find that he finds his feet and performs better. So from time to time, a president might look at his cabinet and shift people around or drop some people and bring new people in. It is something that happens all over the world. We were advocating for the reshuffling of the finance minister because from as far back as 2019, we could predict what was going to happen. A finance minister comes into office and all he knows is to borrow on the international capital markets. And not only because that's all he knows, but also he benefits from the borrowing. Conflict of interest. His company, Data Bank, any time government borrowed, received commissions on the borrowing. And so that was an incentive to borrow. So is it any surprise that in six years, this finance minister borrowed $13.5 billion from the uh, Eurobond market? With all the projects and infrastructure I invested in, in my time in office, the total amount I borrowed from the Eurobond market in the four years was $3.5 billion. In six years, this minister had borrowed $13.5 billion. And that is what has put us in the situation in which we are. And if even that money had been put into productive use and infrastructure, we will not be sitting here and lamenting about this country. But most of that money went into consumption and into dubious projects that have brought no return to this country. And so if the president had reshuffled him earlier, we would not be in this mess that we are. MPP has very capable uh, people. The only reason the president kept him in that office and refused to shuffle him is because he was his cousin. So you ask me, why have I congratulated the president for reshuffling the minister? The distraction has been done. In English, they say it's bolting the stable after the horses have escaped. When the man has finished caputing the economy, you then remove him, and then you say, I should clap for you. I won't clap. <laughs> I won't applaud him. He should have done that much earlier. Ofoyata should have been out of that office in 2019, not at the time that he made him leave. And so I think that's my comment on that. Um, increasing districts. That is part of the expenditure government has to bear. Bernard, unfortunately, it is provided for in the Constitution, and unfortunately, it has been misused by governments. A lot of the time, the motivation for splitting districts is to create additional constituencies. And so you find that 
districts have been split and become unviable because they are too small and do not have economic opportunity to be able to be viable as a district. There are many districts today whose only source of income is District Assembly's Common Fund. And so unfortunately that is what has happened. I remember when I was a Deputy Minister, the districts were under 100, about 90 districts or 70 districts or something like that. Today we have 261. And there is no scientific basis for the division except gerrymandering. Because there are districts that are bigger that should have been divided, that are not divided. But districts that are smaller that should have been left as they are, have been split and created into smaller districts. Because then the party that wins in that district can have two constituencies instead of one. So that is the, the case. Uh, several districts that existed, uh, constituencies that existed have been converted into districts. So, we, in looking at the review of the constitution, we must set some more stringent guidelines for the creation of districts. You know that now every traditional area wants a district. And so we are getting to the stage where every paramount chief wants his traditional area to be a district. Because I go around and traditional uh, paramount chiefs are requesting districts for their traditional areas. That's not what it was meant to be. But if you look in the constitution, the creation of uh, regions is specified and you must go through a process that requires consensus building. Unfortunately, it's not the same with districts. With regions, you must have a commission of inquiry and the commission of inquiry must recommend and when it has recommended, it must go for a referendum. 40% of the people uh, in that region must vote and 75% of them must say yes. And so if we do the constitutional review, we probably must look at making more stringent the creation of more districts. Because if we say it's just based on population and land size, where are we going to stop? Ghana today is 33 million people. It is predicted by, that by 2050 or some, 2030 something, we'll be 50 million people. And so if you say population is the driver, then by uh, the time we are 50 million people, we'll have 600 districts. And so that is a major uh, issue, and I agree with you that um, we should look at that. But I think that there are more opportunities for improving funding to districts. And one of the things that has been forgotten is the issue of property rates. If we collect property rates properly, we can raise money to improve uh, uh, social services in the districts. And so even though AMA has been split up into other uh, uh, districts. I mean, just look at the houses in Accra. Just look at the properties in Accra. Bernard, do you think that if these properties rates are collected properly, the districts will not have enough money to do the drains and do the roads and do everything? So one of the things we're going to do is to support the districts and enhance their capacity to collect their property rates. Because because District Assembly's Common Fund was introduced, property rates are not uh, collected the way they should. My father died and left his house. One day I got a frantic call. Uh, Brad John, come, come, come. Uh, they've come to paste a notice that they're going to sell the house. So I go there and I, I look at the notice. It says, uh, 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 what do they call it? Uh, uh, distress something. And that if we haven't paid and so we're supposed to be taken to court, you know. Meanwhile, I said, ah, but where is the property rate bill? We hadn't received the property rate bill for almost five years. And so they had put the address there of the uh, place where we should go. So I went there and I said, oh, you want to sell my father's house? And um, I don't know, we haven't received any bills. And the man said, oh, your bills, uh, which one is that, the Tessano, da, 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 da. He said, the bills are here. You haven't come for your bills. Oh, I should come. <laughs> for my property rates bill. He says, your bills are here. Look, you haven't paid. Of course, I don't want them to sell my father's house. So I collected the bills and I wrote a check for them. And uh, that ended the story. But I'm saying that we must support the assemblies to be able to give out the bills timelessly and collect the money. And we must value those properties properly. I mean, some of those uh, properties, if you charge 
uh, uh, 5,000 CDs a year. I mean, they'll be willing to pay because the value of the house is worth millions. And so that could be a new source of funding for district assemblies. Accra is getting difficult to manage because of its size and population. And so the city is spreading beyond uh, its limits. It makes it difficult to continue to provide social services to the city. And so I propose that we look at establishing a new city so that we can move some of the agencies out of the city in order to reduce the pressure on Accra. Can you imagine if Nigeria had not built Abuja today? Lagos would have been in gridlock. You would not be able to even walk in Lagos because it would have been shut down. So I said we must start thinking about creating a new city and moving some of the agencies and departments out of the city. But of course, we must connect the two cities with good transportation network so that people can go back and, and forth. And aside from that, it gives us an opportunity to plan that city uh, better and ease the gridlock in Accra. It is not an immediate project. I said I envisage that it will take about 20 years to complete, but we must start somewhere. And that's why I said we'll start the feasibility and planning in the four years that I'm president. Other people will come and begin to implement. And we have the opportunity because the Volta Lake and the river are there. There will be access to uh, uh, clean water. We can make it a smart city where the services are provided. There will be no kiosk and containers littered all over the place. We will provide markets so that if you want to go to the market, there is a properly organized market and everything. There are supermarkets, there are schools, there are parks for recreation and all that. We can even make it a tourist center. We can create amusement parks so that families can go there and have amusement. We can have a water park. We have no water park in this country where you can go with your family and have a nice time. And so I envisage that if we start towards it, we might not live to see the end of it for some of us, but our children and our children's children will benefit from the establishment of a new city like that. Uh, will you review the IMF policy? Um, we will not cancel the IMF policy. It is a policy that our government has signed on to, and they signed on on behalf of government of Ghana. Indeed, when the crisis was reaching epic proportions, we actually asked them to go to the IMF for support because this economy was going to crash, and it would have crashed with severe consequences. And you remember. We will not go to the IMF. We will not go to the IMF today, tomorrow, or as long as we remain in power. We will not go to the IMF. We will not go to the IMF. Eventually, we told them that if you don't go to the IMF walking, you will go in an ambulance. And they ended up there in an ambulance. And so the, um, the conditionalities are more stringent than if we had gone earlier. And so, yes, we've landed in the IMF. We will work with the IMF. They are opportunities in the agreement for tweaking the agreement in some ways, not cancelling it. And so as a new government that comes, we immediately have to say to the IMF, look at the conditionalities that we're giving and see how we can tweak them to suit our present circumstances. Things are clearer now. Because at the time they signed the IMF agreement, the debt restructuring had not been concluded. Today it has been concluded even with the international bondholders. And so we have a more predictable trajectory about how our loans are going to have to be repaid. Even this year, we're supposed to pay 400 and something million dollars of the debt. I don't know where government is going to get that money. We probably will use some of the money the IMF themselves are giving us to pay for it. And that will create problems for the city because we don't have the kind of injection of foreign currency that we should have. I'm committed to an affirmative action bill. The last time I met with the speaker, I urged him to make sure that he passes it in his term as speaker, and that the women of Ghana will be very grateful to him if he's able to pass the affirmative action bill before the life of this parliament ends. Historically, it's one of the bills that has been that has lasted the longest under consideration. And I think that the time has come for us 
to have an affirmative action bill. That one and the amendment to the citizens' bill to allow our dual citizens to participate even uh, in a greater way in the administration of this country. And so that bill too uh, should be passed. The dual citizens uh, should be amended to allow dual citizens to be able to participate. Those two bills are pending before Parliament, and I urge the Speaker to make sure that he passes them before the life of this Parliament ends. Uh, general elections, yes, I remember uh, under Charlotte Ose, um, she announced that their website had been hacked, and so they should continue uh, uh, compiling the, uh, the, the ballots with the manual system. And that's why we have a manual system and we have an electronic system. Uh, the electronic system makes tallying faster, but it does, even though it goes ahead and makes it faster, the manual system must also conclude before the elections are declared because eventually the pink sheets are the name of the game. And so in 2016 and 2020, I wouldn't blame the Electoral Commission completely because the electoral uh, process affords us certain instruments and levers to be able to police the poll. And I must say that, unfortunately, our preparation in terms of using the processes, the electoral process affords us to police the poll, were not effectively used. I can tell you we've learned the lessons from that time. And this time, it is going to be close marking. We're going to put the right people at the polling stations. And for those of you who are NDC supporters, we're asking for volunteers who want to know which polling station you are voting in. We'll train you. And on that day, you will sit there for us. So those of you media people who are NDC supporters, I beg you, <laughs> give us your names. In the morning, you won't go and vote and go away. You vote and sit at your polling station. We would have trained you, and you will be our agent there to make sure that the right thing is done. We are going to man the collation centers. We have trained our people who are going to man the collation centers. They will be there. In some cases, in 2020, uh, 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 agents in the collation center went, and they said, oh, the returning officers have not come yet. So you go home and go and eat and rest and come early in the morning. By the time they came early in the morning, the result had been declared. And uh, of course, it led to confusion. And you remember that uh, some people were killed uh, uh, by that incident. And so we are going to take advantage of the levers that the electoral process offers us to be able to police the poll. So I can assure every Ghanaian voter who votes for the NDC that your vote will be protected. I can assure you of that. Um, Ho Airport um, is currently uh, not functional, but it still gives us the opportunity for medical evacuations and emergency flights. And so several times I've seen the Air Force, you know, land there for one reason or the other. I don't, unfortunately, Passion Air started flights into Ho, but um, the demand was sluggish. And um, I, I'm told that on one flight, they had only a single passenger. <laughs> and so <laughs> it was not sustainable at the time. But I, I don't think we should give up. I think that commercial flights will resume uh, to who if people see that time is precious. And instead of driving that length of time, three hours uh, to uh, Volta region, you probably are better off just flying 20 minutes and arriving uh, on time. And so I do think some things can be done. But I also know that a group is intending to set up a pilot training school at the whole airport of international standard and bring student pilots from all over Africa and Ghanaian students to train as pilots. That would be a useful use of the airport. There are many ancillary activities that we can do, like aircraft maintenance. We can put aircraft hangars there so that uh, aircrafts that need maintenance can come there and maintain. And so it will still be a useful facility, and we will encourage the private sector to make use of it. After all, we've built the facility, and so we just have to encourage and entice the private sector to take advantage of it. And the final question was on Ada Songo Lagoon. I don't know the processes that were used uh, for the award of that concession, 
but I think that is something worth uh, looking at. I know that there was resistance from the people and um, a journalist in the local media station was brutalized and harassed and I hear he eventually died. And so it's something that we should look at, what processes were used, what is the effect of the, on the livelihoods of the people, because that has been a very controversial uh, uh, issue. I remember that uh, there was a company before, Vacuum Salt, you know, that uh, did the same thing. They were run-ins with the uh, people, and eventually the PNDC had to come in and streamline things. So I really don't know what has happened in this case, but of course if we come, we'll take a look at it and see uh, what amelioration uh, is possible in that regard. Uh, when I spoke about uh, taxes, I was told that I was not very clear. There are some nuisance taxes. I thought that when I mentioned COVID levy, you would all have uh, assumed that I, I said we would take the COVID levy off. Is, we are the only country that is still uh, punishing our people for a pandemic that has passed. And so I think that there are other revenue sources that we can use other than uh, the COVID levy. Aside from that e-levy, with all the noise that was made, the revenue that is coming in is one billion cities. And why would you punish people who want to use electronic means of payment only to bring in one billion cities and prevent them from doing so? And it hasn't brought in the required cash because Ghanaians are cashing out because why should I go and use Momo to pay? I pay a 1% transaction fee, then I pay another 1.5% COVID levy. So I pay 2.5%, but my colleague who uses cash to pay does not pay any uh, tax. And so I'll also cash out the money from my Momo wallet and I'll go and buy what I want. And that is why e-levy is not performing. And so if we want people to use more uh, cashless transactions, and I think that we must build a target for ending collecting of cash. You know, all government payments must be cashless, using electronic forms of payment. And if we're able to do that and take the punitive taxes off, I think more people would use it. And so I've said already that we'll abolish e-levy, so that's something that we intend to do. And so the nuisance taxes, we will take them off. And apart from that, like I said, we'll streamline the taxes and we'll make sure that we're able to spread the tax net. We've always talked about it, but this is the time for us to take action. The other time I was wondering, I have a house, people come and service my air conditioners. If there's a, an electrical fault, somebody comes and repairs it. A plumber comes if there's a fault with the plumbing system and all that. And it's a cash economy. I pay them with cash. And I wonder who takes tax from all these people, all these workmen, all these artisans, at least they must pay a small percentage of that so that they also are bearing the uh, burden of the tax net. And so if we can find instruments to be able to reach those people, probably pass legislation that makes it compulsory that if somebody like that comes to work, he must be registered as a qualified plumber or as a qualified electrician. And to be re registered, you must have an electronic payment handle, either a POS or a mobile money uh, system. We must have a means where if you pay him, a small percentage of it goes into the tax net. That will bring more people into the tax net. But these are ideas that we are still distilling and the details of it will be in our manifesto when we launch in August. You will see uh, the meat and the uh, uh, issues that are captured in that manifesto. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Eliza, um, Omaru's question on whether or not you scrap the Office of Special Prosecutor. And uh, Kwekwe Uzeje says he didn't get your answer on what you would do for the customers of the Kulas banks and men's gold. Claire, um, I answered on men's gold, but the Kulas banks. I okay. said that we'll restore the licenses of banks that were unjustifiably taken. You see, the significance of that whole thing is that those banks that were closed were the banks that held the investment of indigenous uh, Ghanaians in the banking sector. Before, most banks were foreign banks until we encouraged Ghanaians to enter the finance and banking sector. And a lot of people like Dr. Undum, Dr. Kwabna Dufour, uh, uh, Heritage, and all those other banks that were closed put their monies in, got licenses, 
and uh, UT Bank and all of them and they run successful operations. You see, those banks were the banks in the riskier end of the markets because they were the ones doing SME lending. And SME lending is the most risky part of the banking sector. The foreign banks lend to big customers, the levers of this world uh, and big customers like that. And those lendings are not risky because the establishments are known and they know that they'll get their money back. And so you could expect that definitely the banks that were working in the SME sector, which is the riskier end of the market, will have liquidity problems based on bad debt and all that. But the answer was not to clean them out, shut them down, throw more than 10,000 banking professionals onto the streets and incur a debt of 25 billion Ghana cities when you could have resolved the matter with less than 5 billion. Because the reason for which they were closed was that they should increase their reserve requirements to 400 million. And so if 10 banks were closed, 400 million is 4 billion. So why couldn't Bank of Ghana give liquidity support to those banks, put them under administration, and make sure that they pay down the equity every year until they are able to uh, re repay the liquidity support. It was done in the case of, I think, the Bank of Scotland also. The British government knew the bank was going down. They gave them a liquidity in in injection and took equity in proportion to the liquidity they gave them. Today, that bank has fully paid. It's one of the strongest banks that you can find uh, in England. And so I think that there were other ways we could have solved this problem without this knee-jerk action of just closing uh, those banks. So I've said that we must restore indigenous investment in the banking sector and we would give back the licenses of those whose banks were uh, unjustifiably taking. There might be financial implications to it, but we must be prepared to, to, to bear those financial implications because when government does wrong, it must restitute. And so I think that these are things that I uh, would look at with regards to the banking sector. Apart from that, not every bank must be a class A bank. And so you can't say every bank must have a reserve ratio of 400 million. Because they lend to different segments of the market. There are banks that are lending to small communities and you know, uh, their reserve requirements should not be 400 million. Why do you need 400 million to establish a bank that is catering to a certain segment of the market? And so we'll have a tiered banking structure for the small banks, class C banks, that lend to the SME sector, 80 million CDs or 100 million CDs is enough for them to uh, uh, operate. For the medium scale banks, 200 million CDs, 300 million CDs is enough for them to operate. And then for the class A banks, the big banks, we can raise the reserve requirements even higher. So I think that that is what we need to look at. Um, OSP, whether will you scrap it or not? Why would I Last scrap one. the office of the OSP? I won't. Thank you, sir. It is an addition to anti-corruption fights. And indeed, the people who set up the OSP office today are the ones trying to remove the special prosecutor. And they are the ones who are insulting the special prosecutor more than anybody else. <laughs> and so the special prosecutor is doing his job. And um, I expect that if we remove political interference in his work, that office can be more, you know, efficient. Today, cases that the special prosecutor took up, I mean, one cannot understand uh, uh, what is happening. You see what happened between the special prosecutor and Yoko. The docket has been sent to Yoko. Yoko said we haven't received any document and all that and all that. And so the case has been left to die. Today, the one million uh, something uh, dollar something under the bed case is effectively dead. And don't think that it died because justice prevailed. It died because of political interference. Another case, PPA went to court and the judge ordered the unfreezing of the accounts. The day he ordered the unfreezing of the accounts, the next day all the money was withdrawn from the accounts. And so we need to create an environment where the special prosecutor can work and work on behalf of the people of Ghana. 
And so I will not scrap that office. I will strengthen that office to be able to investigate those who are leaving office, who have been harassing the prosecutor, and also investigating my people who will fall foul of the law. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you will agree with me that what has happened in this auditorium this evening is historic. Two hours of questions and answers. I have never seen any opposition leader do this. And Your Excellency, I think you need to tell us the secret of your stamina. But even me, because even me, my young bones are suffering here. Thank you very much for what you've done for us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, my job is done. I will hand over to my sister Joyce Mukhtari Bawa, who will be closing us. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Thank you to our distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, our friends from the media, event PR, our fantastic ladies and gentlemen from the greatest political party in the history of this country, the National Democratic Congress. And of course, to our lovely, amazing, accomplished running mate, Professor Nana Jeno Pukwajima. Thank you so much for making time to join us this evening. And yes, to all the cameramen, to the JM bloggers, and all you wonderful people who have made the last three hours such an illuminating experience. We are indeed very grateful. To my boss, my favorite gentleman, affable, kind, warm, knowledgeable, full of wisdom. Thank you so much for the enthusiasm, for your energy, sir. And yes, for responding to each and every question that you received tonight. And hopefully, all of our brothers and sisters here will indeed put you to strict proof tomorrow morning as the clock starts and everybody starts to ask questions. We will all be available to answer any other questions you have and whatever clarifications you seek. So on behalf of all of us here at the NDC, at the Office of the Flag Bearer, I bid you all safe journeys to your homes and Godspeed and to say that we are very, very grateful to you each and every one of you for making the time. So yes, I think that it's still my responsibility to say a very short closing prayer. So may I ask all of us to please rise up to express our gratitude to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a wonderful evening. We thank you for your guidance. We thank you for this illuminating experience, for your presence, and for the fact that you made it possible all of us here have been enlightened and we ask that you will lead us safely back to our homes. As the campaign gears up to a good start, Father, we invite you into our campaigns, we invite you into our lives, into our messages, and we ask you that all of us here will work very, very hard to build the Ghana that all of us will be proud of. We thank you through Christ our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And please have a lovely evening. Thank you.